stay in order. We got the mic. Everything's in order. Before we ask the Reverend Bowman to give the invocation, I want to make an announcement and uh, acknowledge the presence of Mr. Jim Blunt with a OSHA office here in Jackson. As you recall, Mr. Blunt was on our program uh, Monday, wasn't able to get here and sent Mr. Crow, one of his assistants, to fill in for him and we got bogged down and had a lengthy session and uh, elected not to bring uh, Mr. Crow on. And uh, Mr. Blunt is here now. He's available in the event any of you would like to discuss a problem with him. We won't be able to bring him up and put him on the program, it looks like, today, but we would like you to know he's here, and we'd like him to stand out front where everybody can see. Mr. Blunt, there he is, right there, the gentleman with all the curly hair. There's some of these folks over here can't see. You've got a safety problem in your place of work, that's the man to see. He wrote a phone number outside, have you, Jim? Okay? Well, I get outside, they'll cover you up in a few minutes. <laughs> We're a privilege this morning to have with us the Reverend S.L. Bowman, <coughs> pastor of the Greater Clark Street Baptist Church here in Jackson, Mississippi, to bring the invocation. It's been my privilege for the last several years to have been associated with the Reverend Bowman on several different occasions and attempting to work out problems relating to either this organization or the problems of some other labor organization in the Jackson area. And it appears that I might perhaps have to be calling on him and a few other people after this convention Adjourns. I understand that the Policeman's Union is having difficulties or been having difficulties while we've been in session here today and we just might have to strike the whole city of Jackson before it's over with. And we, we're going to probably have to be calling on you and some other people before we get this situation straight. Let's go. Now I'm asked the Reverend Foreman to come and give the invocation. But while he's here, if, he's had, if he has anything on his mind that he'd like to say, he's welcome to do so. Reverend Bowman, we're happy to have you. Please come forward. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for having brought us to this day. Forgive us, we pray, of our many sins and weaknesses, and give us another chance as our children. We come praying thy benediction upon this organization. Bless their deliberations here this week. We pray that something will be said or done to glorify thee and advance thy kingdom on earth in the hearts of men. Bless, we pray, the leadership of our nation and those <coughs> men who rule in authority Help them to realize that righteousness exalts as a nation, but sin is reproach to any people. Lead us now, guide us, love us, and protect us. For it is in Jesus' name we ask, and for his sake we pray. Amen. <coughs> member and your friend Bob Woodson that I could not stay because of a previous commitment. I am on the faculty at the Mississippi Baptist Seminary and the class is waiting for me right now. So I called over there and told the secretary to inform the class to just cool it until I get there. <laughs> but it's good to be here. It's good to see all of you and I say I hope that you will have a successful session here and that all of your goals will be realized. Uh, in terms of 
what is going on in the city of Jackson. I certainly can appreciate your interest in the city of Jackson, in people, the working people. For the working people are the people who pay me. So I have to be with the working people. You know, if I have to take a stand with the, decide between the mayor and the governor and the working folk, I'm going to decide with the working people. Because working people. You don't always make a lot of friends like that, but at least I can sleep at night and I can live with myself. Thank you very kindly. It's so good to be here. God bless all of you. situation with the people in Washington and several years ago <coughs> about this. <coughs> and it was agreed that if we call the roll and announce the name of the delegate, the number of votes that, that delegate had, by virtue of his local union having given that person those votes, then if that person was given the ballot with his name on it, Mark the ballot, put in the box, that this would suffice for an open election. It's not done this way, then it'd take about two days to call the roll. You'd have to call the roll and each delegate get up and announce, go down the ballot and announce how he or she voted for each candidate. Now apparently we had some people present uh, yesterday that didn't understand this, that they felt that this was a secret ballot election, and they didn't understand why their name was on the ballot. 
And I'd like to read you the article from the rules governing state central bodies now in order that everybody will clearly understand it. Because somebody has raised a question about how do they go about setting aside the election. Well, the election could only be set aside, I think, if you establish the fact that we have violated the rules governing local and state central bodies. So I'll be very brief and try to read it for your benefit. A roll call on elections may be conducted orally, or it may be conducted by written or printed ballots were it deemed desirable to expedite the holding of the election, provided each ballot clearly shows the name, organization, and number of votes of the delegate casting the ballot. Such ballots shall become part of the records of the central body and shall be preserved and available for examination by any delegate or officer of an affiliated organization for a period not less than six months. I regret very much that we had delegates present that did not understand that this was not a secret ballot election, that this was the device that had been worked out with the national office and that it was in compliance with the rule that I just read to you. Now, later on in this session, we'll have an opportunity to get into this matter if someone wants to. And if you want to have another election, convention here wants to vote to have a wide open election, then you can do so. But it'll have to be done by a majority of delegates present in order to have it again. Okay? All right, at this time, I'm going to re recognize Sister Mary L. Whips. Are you going to start? Sister Brown and Sister Whips are both up here. I explained to you. The op during the opening day, that Sister Whips, Bryant, and uh, uh, Tyson, Brother G.L. Tyson, has been appointed to the audit committee. Brother Tyson got sick and was not able to work well. And these two ladies will now proceed to give you the audit report. I understand you're going to do it in section. And as you've already been advised by Brother Knight, does any delegate present wishes a copy of the audit that's been given here, and all you have to do is to write us and we'll put it in the mail. The committee elected not to produce it and put it on the table because they were fearful that somebody outside the organization would get a copy of it and use it against us later on. Sister Webbs. Thank you, President Ramsey, Secretary Knight, delegates, and guests. Mrs. Bryant and myself want to thank you for, the app for appointing us to do the auditing report for 1974. For the purpose of those delegates that don't know, the auditing committee also do the office report, and we will give both reports while we are here. We find all expenditures and income accounted for, and with such a large operation, they are to be commended for the fine job they are doing. Before we go into the audit report, we, the 1974 Arden Committee, request that this report do not be a part of the convention proceeding and copies of this report do not be passed out. Now the report. Mrs. Brown will read a portion and I will conclude the report. <coughs> Audit Committee's report to the 7th Biennial Convention of the Mississippi AF of LCIO, October 21, 2, 3, and 4, 3, 1974. <coughs> Financial records were audited by the Audit Committee in accordance with the Mississippi AF of LCIO Constitution, Article 10, Section 10. The records of the general fund were examined by the Barnett and Trident firm, CPA, of Jackson, Mississippi for the years 1972-1973. This report covers all the three funds of the council, the general fund, the legislative fund, and the code fund. Comments. On April 1, 1973, the Employees Severance Pay Fund Agreement was amended, changing the amount to be paid by the employees and the council from 2.5% to 7%. Insurance in force, December 31, 1973, was as follows. 
the Delta bond, officers and employees, $5,000, workman's compensation, legal liability, special multi-parent policy, building contents liability, $25,000 each, medical payments, $250,000, $10,000, camera, $1,208, automobile, liability, $5,100, collision, $50 deductible, comprehensive ACV. Liability. A loan was obtained on July 15, 1969 from the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations in the amount of $30,000 to purchase a building and lot at 826 Northwest Street in Jackson, Mississippi for the Mississippi AFL-CIO. The building is being repaid in monthly installments of $300. On December 1, 1973, there was a balance of $14,100. A second loan was received from the AFL-CIO on October 1, 1970 for $6,500 in order to make necessary major repairs to the building. This loan is being repaid in monthly installments of $100 and at December 31, 1973, there was a balance of $2,700. In order to have adequate parking space, the lot on the north side of the office building was purchased for $15,000. In February 1973, $10,000 was borrowed from the AFL-CIO to apply to this purchase. The loan is to be paid over a period of five years. There was a balance of $9,000 at December 31, 1973. On September 25, 1972, an address draft form feeder was purchased for $1,000 $3.44 with a loan from Deposit County National Bank. During the year 1973, this loan was paid. On February 17, 1969, a copier was purchased from A.B. Dick Company and financed through Deposit County National Bank. The balance of this loan was paid in 1972. On September 27, 1971, a 1972 Chevrolet Impala was purchased and was financed through Deposit Guarantee National Bank. The balance of this loan was paid in 1973. A 1972 Chevrolet Bel Air was purchased on February 7, 1972, and $2,460.12 was financed by the Policy Guarantee Bank. The loan is being liquidated by monthly installments of $113.95, and at December 31, 1973, there was a balance of $227.90. Assets. An inventory of office furniture and equipment owned by the Mississippi AFL CIO reveals an estimated value of furniture and equipment of approximately $31,762. Opinion. In our opinion, the attached statements of receipts and disbursements present accurately the transactions of the Mississippi AFL CIO for the years 1972 and 1973 as reflected to us by the records. Respectfully submitted, Audit Committee, Mary Nell Williams, Chairman, IBEW 2262, Mary I. Bright, CWA 1050, The General Fund. Fiscal year January 1st, 1972 to December 31st, 1972. Balance January 1st, 1972, $14,425.66. Total receipts, $1,000. $113,024.64. Total disbursements, $108,904.35. Balance December 31, 1972, $18,545.96. Disbursements were as follows. Salaries, officers, full time, $30,062.28. Salaries, clerical, $17,350.42. Salaries, executive board and others, $2,800.96. Expenses, officers full time, $4,080.64. Expenses, executive board and others, $4,073.02. Equipment purchase, $1,087.03. Automobile expenses, $5,208.28.26. Insurance, employees, $3,652.47. Contributions and donations, $1,620. Billing expenses, 
at 826 Northwest Street, Jackson, Mississippi, $2,231.24. <coughs> Education, Public Relations, and Education, $6,034.26. General Expenses, $18,832.47. Convention Expenses, $6,654.24. Other Disbursements, $5,217.06. Total Disbursements were $108,904.35. The explanation of the 1972 <coughs> general fund disbursements. Disbursement items, salaries, officers full time. This reflects the salaries of president and secretary treasurer. Salaries clerical full time. This re reflects the salaries of two full time secretaries and additional office personnel needed during the year. Salaries part time. This reflects the salaries of part-time employed vice presidents and executive board members. Expenses full-time. This item shows the travel and related expenses incurred by the president, secretary treasurer, and other employees. Expenses part-time. This item shows the travel and related expenses by executive board members and vice president. Equipment purchased. This item reflects the cost of a Bellingham cassette recorder, A. B. Dick spindle and address graph form feeder. Automobile expenses. This reflects payments on auto loan, gas and oil, repairs, service and tires, insurance, tags, and so forth. Insurance. This reflects the cost of employees group hospital life insurance and workman's compensation. Contributions and donations were made to disabled American veterans, Elizabeth Brewer, Coke Delegate, Pharaoh Strikers Holiday Fund, League of Women Voters, Mount Way Baptist Church, Muscular Dystrophy Association, Southern Labor School, and Southern States Apprenticeship Conference. Building expenses reflects insurance on building pest control, janitorial services, supplies and upkeep, utilities, which would not be reflected in normal yearly expenses. Educational, public relations, and legislative expenses reflects expenses for A. Philip Randolph Institute, Mississippi Labor Institute, educational expenses and material, advertising and public relations, leg legislative session, political and legislative expenses, general expenses. This covers AFL CIO dues, audit and professional <coughs> expenses, employees uniform, equipment repairs and service contracts, office supplies, Rent on Cascadoula office reimbursement is received from the National HRDI. Postage, severance contributions, taxes, FICA and unemployment, subscriptions, telephone and telegraph, and other miscellaneous expenses. <coughs> convention expenses reflects the cost of printing, supplies, convention proceedings, lunches and refreshments, and legislative banquets. Other disbursements reflects payments made on loans to National AFL-CIO and Deposit Guarantee National Bank. General Fund, fiscal year January 1st, 1973 to December 31st, 1973. Balance January 1st, 1973, $18,545.96. Total receipts, $128,514.80. Total disbursements, $126,386.48. Balance December 31st, 1973, $20,674.28. Disbursements were as follows. Salaries, officers full-time, $31,500. Salaries, clerical, $17,248.54. Salaries, executive board and others, $350.39. Expenses, officers full time, $3,450.69. Expenses, executive board and others, $1,549.14. General expenses, $23,420.43. Automobile expenses, $5,169.91. Insurance, $4,036.20. Contributions and donations, $1,885. Building expenses, 
$3,300.08. Education, public relations, and legislative expense, $7,209.48. Capital expenditures, which was the purchase of the law, $15,672.28. Other disbursements, $11,594.34. Nineteen seventy three general fund explanation of disbursements. The uh, items one through eight would have the same explanation as nineteen seventy two. Uh, number uh, item number nine, which is contributions and donations, were made to employ the hand, uh, to the organization employ the handicapped, disabled American veterans, Mississippi Council on Economic Education, Northview Exchange Club, Barrel Workers Strike. Uh, Strikers Holiday Fund, Mississippi Highway Patrol Benefit Fund, George L. Watkins Retirement Dinner, Diabetic Youth, Veterans of Foreign Wars, Muscular Dystrophy Association, <coughs> Christmas at Oakley, Legion Christmas Fund, Southern Labor School, Southern States Apprenticeship Conference. Oh, item number 10, which is the um, uh, building expense, was uh, the same as the previous year, except for the remodeling expense and the addition of some parking. Uh, item number 11, which is education, public relations, and legislative expense, was the same except for the purchase of Mississippi A and Bell's CIO auto tags and organizing activities expenses. Item number 12, capital expenditures, uh, included the purchase of the lot next door to the building site on State Street. Other disbursements were the same as the previous year. <coughs> the Legislative Fund for 1972. Account number 25-182-70, Deposit Guarantee National Bank, Jackson, Mississippi. Balance file of Jan January the 1st, 1972, $3,580.47. Receipt, National AFL-CIO Educational Fund, $19,000. International Unions, $3,250. Local Union CLUs in Mississippi, $3,821.60. Miscellaneous, $150. Total $26,221.60. Mississippi Chapter A Philip Disbursements. Mississippi Chapter A Philip Randolph Institute, $405. Democratic Primary, $5,803.74. General Education, three candidates, $14,848.94. Miscellaneous, $500. $21,557.68. Balance on hand, December 31st, 1972, $8,244.39. Expenditures that in, for the Democratic primary, these expenses that include the 1972 Congressional Democratic primary, includes voter reg registration and education expenses, salaries and expenses for three extra girls in office and in the field. District meeting for interviewing candidates, three district mailings, and one statewide to all members. Extra long distance telephone expenses and full-time office extra expenses and campaign. Expenses in 1972 election in support of three congressional candidates, which includes voter registration and get out the vote expenses, salary and expenses, so I get it on, please advise any investors that might show up right now in the executive session to just had a view of the walk in. Should have made this announcement at the beginning. This is an executive session for the benefit of the delegates. Salary and expense for extra help in office and WAD director for two months, two statewide mailings for membership, posters, printing, and so forth plus extra expenses of full-time offices and long-distance telephone calls. Financial statements. <coughs> Financial statements, Mississippi AFL-CIO, 1973 Legislature Fund. Deposit Guarantee National Bank, Jackson, Mississippi. Balance for all power, January 1st, 1973. 
$8,244.39. Receipts, contributions, $1,050. Miscellaneous, $2,000. Total of income, $1,250. Total on hand, $9,494.39. Disbursements, contribution to candidates, $400. Leaving a balance on the balance of December 31st, 1973, $9,094.39. 1972 financial statement for Mississippi AFL CIO Coach Farm, which is free money. Account First National Bank, Jackson, Mississippi. Balance for forward January 1st, 1972, $658. Receipt, total dollar sold at conventions, $468. International unions, $5,605. National AFL Seattle Coast, $3,000. Total income, $9,073. Total on hand, $9,731. Disbursement, contribution to candidate, $8,756.04. Leaving balance on hand as of December 31st, 1972. $974.96. Financial statement for 1973 of Coke Fund, which is free money. First National Bank, Jackson, Mississippi. Balance brought file was $974.96. Received Coke dollars sold, $166. Total on hand, $1,140.96. Disbursement not. Leaving the balance as of December 31st. $1,140.96. This concludes the audit report, and due to the length of the office report, we will omit reading the report, but urge all delegates to read the copies you have. We have, we the audit committee and office report committee, recommend that the full-time officers and the secretaries at the state AFL CIO office. Therefore, it is the recommendation of the audit committee that all full-time officers employees is, as Mr. Ramsey, Bro Knight, and the two full-time secretaries be given at least three extra days off due to the workload of this convention and the congressional campaign that is not in private progress. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the order report, and we remove that the, be accepted by the convention and this committee be released. Thank you very much, uh, Webster and Bright. Uh, such a well done report. I was especially interested in the last part of it. Uh, I assure you that if it's adopted, we'll do our best to take the three days off. I don't know how we're going to find the time to do it, but we'll do our best. You've heard the committee's report and the recommendations to adopt. If we have any discussion, motion before the House. Ready for the vote? All in favor of a motion signified by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Thank you so much for such a good report. And I can tell you one thing, these girls worked. I can verify that fact. I was down there late at night several times myself, and we did have an audit. So they did an excellent job. Thank you very much, both of you. I think I should also mention to you that this, as many of you have already got, is a two-year report <clears throat> on the affairs of the organization. One thing that's not reflected in that report in there now, and I suspect that you didn't catch this, and that's the fact that these loans that we made from the National FFL CO were interest-free loans. Uh, we talked them out of loaning us the money to buy the building and the lot interest-free. So we saved ourselves a considerable amount of money by knowing the right people in Washington. Thank you so much. Uh, we are privileged this morning to have with us the Deputy Director of the AFL CIO Human Resource and Development Institute, <coughs> Mr. Charles Bradford. Before I bring him on to deliver his address, I simply want you to know this that we consider one of our major roles in this organization the development of our human resources here in the state. 
We were, we're a little bit late today in getting in on <coughs> HRDI. But when we got started, we went all the way. In addition to HRDI, we're also involved in the Appalachian Council, another program sponsored by several FMLCO state councils, primarily in the Appalachian region. Uh, but because of several different factors, we were able to convince them that we ought to be involved in that program as well. And I'd like to now inquire Brother Wilkes, the executive director of the Appalachian Council, has he been able to stay this long with us? Or is he gone? Great very much, I wasn't able to introduce him to you. Uh, but we've had a time problem, as all of you know. And anyhow, he's been our guest at this convention. And also, I'd like to make an inquiry. Robert Cobb present for the Pascagoula program, RTP. Is he here? Is Bob present? Well, I'd like for you folks in Pascagoula to let Bob know that at least I made an effort to recognize him and introduce him to you. But guys, while we were involved in, when we first got involved in H with HRDI, we had a problem with the lift and shipbuilding industry, and it became apparent that we had to get a program together down there to help cope with that problem. Now, we talked about this at our last convention. We were able and fortunate at that time and to convince an HRDI <coughs> to assign a man to the Lytton problem, the project. At the same time, we were able to convince, which is now the recruitment and training program, uh, sponsored by primarily the A. Philip Randolph Institute, again funded by him with labor monies, to come in and help us put together a program Combination HRDI and RTP designed to recruit primarily, primarily minorities for the trades in that shipyard. We think we've got a smart program going on down there. We've naturally had a few problems with it. But I think from an overall point of view, the program has went off real good. And we're fortunate today to have <coughs> Brother Bradford with us who is the Deputy Director of HRDI, and one of the programs involved in Lytton, Brother C. D. <coughs> Turner, who is here, stand up. He's been the Chief of Police during the convention. You all know him now. Is the HRDI representative. Brother Turner spends a lot of time in trying to recruit people for that program, and he's placed people in jobs elsewhere than Lytton. One, I think, one of the real good programs, Charles, that uh, CB's been able to develop uh, since he's been on the job, is a program tied in with the state penitentiary, quite. And, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, are looking at this program now, and a lot of people want to take credit for it, uh, but I can truthfully tell you that CB Tunn is the guy that put this one together. This is a program designed to reclaim, if you please, People that have been sent to prison. Brother Tun is working with these people, these individuals, and in attempting to establish programs that will make these people productive citizens, place them on jobs where they can make a decent living, even while they're on parole. Well, and with those remarks, uh, Brother Bradford, I didn't mean to take up so much of your time, but I thought it's important here this morning that the delegates understand why. We're involved in all of these programs, and you will be our speaker this morning to discuss human resource and development. Brother Bradford is a former machinist. I found out this morning why Brother Turner was so insistent on Brother B Bradford uh, being on this program. He didn't tell me he was a fellow machinist, and he told me this. Perhaps uh, I would agree to got him in at an earlier stage, CB. Now I better understand why Brother Tony wanted Mr. Bradford on the program. I'm a kid, of course. He uh, is out of the Machinist Union. He's been very active in the labor movement. Uh, uh, delegate to the St. Louis Central Labor Council, I believe. He's a young man. He's aggressive. He's doing an excellent job with the department, and we're happy to have him with us here this morning. 
Brother Bradford, it's all yours. Thank you, President Ramsey, brothers and sisters, fellow trade unionists. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here this morning to talk about the Human Resources Development Institute, uh, kind of a favorite subject of mine, uh, particularly uh, I probably a lot of people don't know too much about the HRDI. You probably know a lot about Carol. He's probably one of the most active uh, HRDI reps that we have, and I'll probably say a few words about Carol. But the Human Resources Development Institute is a nonprofit corporation that was formed by the Executive Council of the AFL-CIO back in 1968. And the purpose of the HRDI is, in fancy terms, is to get the poor and the disadvantaged into the economic mainstream of America. That simply means that we're sort of carrying out the mandate of President Amini. President Amini has said for years, the way out of poverty is with a good job, with good wages. And we feel that that can be done best with and through the labor movement. Those are the kinds of things we've been doing. Now, we have a structure, of course. We have a board of trustees. And that board of trustees is uh, composed of members of the executive council. The chairman of our board is President Meany. President of our organization is President Julius Rothman, who was also the associate director for the Department of Urban Affairs for the AFL-CIO. You can see we're a real labor-oriented organization. We have 52 offices throughout the United States. All are staffed by men and women, black, white, Mexican-American, Spanish surname, Indian. We have a rather well-integrated staff. But the important point is that they're all trade unionists. They're all men like Carol Turner who know and respect the labor movement, feel that the labor movement can do what it's been doing so well for years. Take care and care about the people. And as I said, you know, our board, uh, having a, a board of trustees, one of the uh, been on the board, Mr. Abel. This is the, uh, you know Mr. Abel here at the convention, and uh, this is the first time I've ever had to speak. But Mr. Abel was going to be behind me, and we're going to have a, a report to the executive council, and I guess it makes me a little nervous thinking that one of the trustees is going to be saying, oh yeah, I saw Charlie uh, down at the convention just the other day. And I won't say that makes me too nervous, but it kind of reminds me about the uh, fella who's going to give a speech walked into the room and he's sitting there working on his speech to see going over it. The lady says to him, he says, pardon me, but are you, uh, are you a little nervous? He says, oh no, I'm just kind of concerned about giving this speech today. And he continues on, the lady says, no, wait a minute. He said, you sure you're not nervous? He says, no, no, I'm just concerned. It's a very important speech for me today. She says, well, if you're just concerned and not nervous, he says, I do wish to have you get out of the ladies' room. <laughs> I think I feel just about a little bit that kind of nervousness. I had a prepared speech I was going to give my one of these days my secretary, she's just going to take me and carry me apart. She goes through all this trouble and we work these speeches out and she types them up, prepares them, and I take them along with me and set them aside because I think when I get with groups of folk like this here in Mississippi and uh, with not find people like Carol, I feel more like Let's just really talk about what we're all about, what the HRDI is all about, the kind of things that we're doing. You know, we are really concerned about the poor and the disadvantaged. This is labor has always been. And we're sort of, the HRDI is not doing all of these things by ourselves, but we're doing them with and through the labor movement. Because of people like President Ramsey, people like yourself, we are able to accomplish the kinds of things that we do. We work with the poor, the disadvantaged, those on the welfare road. We work with veterans, and prisoners. And we work the whole gamut of the disadvantaged. And our staff does an excellent job because there are people like Carol Turner who care about other people. We operate a vocational training program for prisoners down in Fort Worth, Texas, where we're training them in the trades of iron working, carpentry, and painting. When they are eligible for release, they're able to be put into the unions, not simply by HRDI by the business representatives who are concerned and want to see that these people do not return to prison again. We have a veterans assistance program that we operate in, in Oakland, California, that when the veteran is being discharged, we 
take his job history, and we send that job history back to his hometown before he even gets there. Our area representative usually has a job lined up for that veteran so that when he returns home, he at least has some place to start and at a time when the job is very hard to get. That's, I think, is a, a very important point. I think everybody knows how tough it is uh, to find a job right now. Uh, the labor market is extremely tough. But because our people care, because of our tie-in with the labor movement, we're able to be successful. Justice Carroll has been successful here in Mississippi. Claude, I think, very well kind of gave us a little overview of what, what Carroll has done. Carroll is one man working in Pascagoula, Mississippi, that since January has placed about 255 people into a job. 255 people, that's by himself. And these are people who meet the poverty criteria established by the Department of Labor. People have particular problems, particularly those who are prison. So I said, you know, he's worked with the prisons, not only in this area, he's been able to work with the, the prisons in the nearby states to give people a chance you know, to make a new way of life. Because if they don't make that new way of life, I think you know what happens. They resort to crime, which affects you and I. But Carol, the kind of thing that he's done, the first of the year, has placed 125 prisoners in good paying jobs. Jobs that average about $3.50 an hour. Now see, you know, that's the thing. You put a man in a good job, paying a good wage, and he's not going to resort to crime. And that's what we're trying to prove. Carol has done it, you know, in a better way. We have all kinds of training programs for the poor and the disadvantaged. Carol has shown that what with labor and organized labor and management cooperating together to solve a common problem, that that can be done without a lot of fancy training programs. But if you really show the, the individual that you're interested, that you care about it, he's going to work hard on that job. And that's the kind of thing that Carol has done. In fact, he's He's probably, and is without a doubt, developed the finest prison program in our whole organization. In fact, we, I think it's so good that we had the people from New York come down to look at Carol's program to go back and try and design a program similar to this one here. He's done such a fine job. And I think you people in Mississippi should be mighty proud of a fellow like Carol Turner who's working with Pat Google, a fine gentleman. I enjoy coming down with because he always takes me down and shows me where that good barbecue is. And I did love that barbecue when I was down. But I really didn't come here this, this morning to talk a whole lot about HRDI. I do that, I do that rather easily uh, because uh, I was able to be one of the first area representatives when we started out in this, in this organization. And, and I've kind of lived with it and, and helped mold it. I really love it. It's really a part of my life. What I come to talk to you a little bit about this morning, I think, is something that's much more important than that. Now, I want to talk about manpower programs. What are they? You know, they're really they're funds to create training programs or to create jobs for people who have no skills. And this is not really new to you. Uh, many of the unions in this state have been involved in these various kinds of programs. The MDTA programs you've been involved in. Of laborers and the machinists that had free apprenticeship programs, where we've used federal funds, you know, to create training programs for the disadvantaged. But there's also programs for our union members also. But there's a new law now that has changed from what we've had. Because all those programs that we, as we knew them, these on-the-job training programs and the way they were funded and how they were planned and how they were operated, those are all things of the past because of this new law called CETA. Comprehensive Employment Training Act, 1973. And it's put in new terms, <coughs> decentralization and decategorization. Whenever you get anything new, you always get something fancy. You know, and these are two new fancy terms. What they simply mean is that the monies, the way we knew that they were coming down, come down in a different way. And instead of coming down to the program operator, now the law states that any city our unit of local government, which has a population of 100,000 or more, is eligible for these funds. So now they've taken the funds and distributed by formula to these local prime sponsors. And it decategorized. What they're saying now is 
All right, no longer are we going to say this is the kind of a program that this area needs for the disadvantaged. We're going to let that local prime sponsor, who is usually the mayor or the governor, you know, that he's going to set up a planning council to determine what kinds of, of programs you know, that you'll have in your particular local area. Now, we're a little concerned about this, and we should be, because you know, we've had a little experience with when you take federal funds and you don't have any strings attached to it, and then you just give that money to a local governor you know, or a local mayor, we're very concerned about what he's going to do with the, that money. What kind of a program is he going to design? Is it going to be a non-union program? Is, he, is the law going to state you know, that uh, there's certain things you're supposed to do? Is he going to comply with that law? Is he going to let us know what's going on? We're very concerned about all of these kinds of things because we have an interest in this money. You know, first of all, it's our tax money. Our money. We've, we've put a lot of our hard-earned tax dollars into these federal funds, and we want to know how it's going to be used. For many months now, the governor and the mayor in this area have been developing a plan on how this manpower money is going to be used. $20 million is going to come into the state of Mississippi for manpower training programs. And I think that you should be concerned about how that $20 million is going to be spent. And we've already had some experience with programs as they come in in the form of revenue sharing. And the thing to remember is that CETA is not really revenue sharing. The AFL-CIO fought very hard against revenue sharing with no strings attached. But there is a law in effect, and there are monies that are coming into the areas. This program is simply called revenue sharing. And it basically is, is supposed to have strings to it. There's supposed to be public notification on how this money is being spent. By all the reports that are coming in, we know that the money is being primarily spent to, to keep the taxes down, to reduce taxes. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Certainly, we all feel that our, that our taxes are high enough. These monies were really put in the areas for social programs, to help the poor and the needy, the aged, handicapped children, these, these kinds of things. But it was put in the area saying to the local government, OK, you decide what your community needs. And have they really used the money in that way? They have, they have disclosure laws that say you're supposed to let the people know what's going on. Now, I'm talking about revenue sharing money. Now, they're supposed to let you know what's happening. You know? And we know that in some cases, in some states, they're building golf courses with that money, that they're building uh, swimming pools with that money. <coughs> We're concerned because, you know, as labor people and as working people, we feel that that money should be used for the working people, for the poor, the disadvantaged. For example, as I said, the money comes in and they're supposed to leave you know what it happens with. Well, revenue in revenue sharing, now this is different from CEDA money, but the money from revenue sharing that has come into Mississippi so far and that will be coming into it through the rest of 1974 is $237 million. $237 million is coming into this area in the form of revenue sharing. Do you know how that money is being used? What kind of building are they doing with it if they're building? You know, are they complying with our collective bargaining agreements? But more importantly, what is it doing for people? That's just an example of what happens when local government you know, is the, is the prime sponsor and has this money with no strings attached. And that's what concerns us. If we have this kind of a thing that's going on, what's going to happen when the CETA money starts coming in? What's going to happen to this $20 million that's, that is primarily for jobs and for job training programs? We feel it should be concerned. You know, because the new legislation has very definite laws and set up a very definite structure, set up a manpower planning council to advise these governors and these mayors as to how this money should be spent. And it also states that labor should be represented on these manpower planning councils. And by and large in this state, we are represented. But we need to be more actively involved. We not just need to be in on the planning, but we need to be involved on the evaluation. How are these programs being conducted? Are they really servicing the poor 
Are we getting the, you know, the proper tax dollar out of it? And why can't a labor union be a program operator? We're as certainly as skilled as anyone else when it comes to you know, developing jobs and training people for jobs. Labor could play a very important role in these kinds of programs. We need to be there to keep a watch on them, to see what they're doing for the people, but also we got to protect our membership. If the local government is planning these programs, what kind of plan programs are they? Are they programs that involve the labor union? <coughs> Do they violate our collective bargaining agreement? Do the law says that they're supposed to pay the minimum wage. Are they paying the minimum wage? They're supposed to not violate the safety laws. Are these jobs being created in areas where they are violating the safety laws? Is the client really being protected? You know, and that's what we're concerned about. How is this $20 million going to be used in Mississippi? I think you should be very concerned about that. You can say, well, what's the importance of these manpower programs? Why should be, we really be concerned? Well, this is why HRDI was really formed. The AFL-CIO knew that you have many things on your mind. You have many activities that you have to be involved in. Collective bargaining agreements, political activity, you know. And how do you get involved in these kinds of things? Well, you're going to need some kind of technical assistance. And that's why the HRDI was set up, to provide that kind of technical assistance to you, to help you when you become involved. And we have people like Gerald Turner who are qualified to do these kinds of things. Why should we be concerned? Because when we sit on these committees and we watch these tax dollars, we carry through that same kind of concern that we carry through for our own members, for our people in the labor movement, because we are concerned about the poor. And that's, that's the tie-in with all of these programs. These programs are for the poor. These funds are to develop training programs for the poor and the disadvantaged, and we should be concerned because these programs will give new skills to these people and they'll create new jobs. You know, what can a new job or a new skill mean in human terms? Well, perhaps it can mean the difference between a job and no job. Or perhaps even the difference between a union job, which will pay the man more money. Perhaps it can mean the difference between able to support your family and not supporting your family. These programs, perhaps, can mean the difference between working or being on welfare. And that's why they are a concern to us in the HRDI, they're a concern of the AFL-CIO, and we're sure that they're a concern for you. And we promise you in the HRDI, to Carol Turner and the rest of our staff, that if you are concerned, if you want to be involved in manpower and manpower planning, we plan and we are prepared to assist you. In conclusion, I just want to say that as long as we have people like Carol Turner who are dedicated to assisting the poor, the HRDI is always going to be with you here in Mississippi helping you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johnny. I'd like to spend about 30 minutes commenting on uh, some of his remarks, especially about CETA, but I we don't have that kind of time, so I will withhold those remarks. Except to say this, that um, I think it's probably better, Charlie, uh, to completely repeal the CETA Act altogether. Let's start all over again. I'll tell you why a little later on. I got some views on the whole thing that some of these money, and some of these programs are being used to build political organizations for the mayors of some of these towns and including the city of Jackson. We'll talk about that a little later. That's another story. We don't have time to get into it right now, but we will be getting into that matter before we get much further down the road in this organization. I can show you that here today. <clears throat> so much for that. Well, we must have somebody at the newsworthy here this morning. I see the newsman who arrived. Uh, we're not going to pull any surprises on you today, except that we might switch positions with uh, Mr. Dean and Mr. A. They're both here. Uh, so I would uh, recommend to you that uh, if you came for uh, Miss Gannon, she's here, you won't have to wait for her. If you want to get Mr. Abel, uh, <clears throat> you might get Mr. Dean in place of Mr. Abel if you came for Mr. 
Uh, hey, uh, Dean, you might get Mr. Abel in his place. And just remember, we might swap positions with him here this morning. As our, as our guest on and next speaker, Ms. Gant, is she here? Would the committee please bring her forward, please? I cleaned our place out too well last night, like not I had enough chairs when I was checking on. Ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged to have with us this morning a very distinguished young lady. I, I started to say our first lady, uh, Miss Gandy. From a practical point of view, you really are our first lady because you hold the highest selective office of any lady in the state of Mississippi. We're very proud of you. Miss Gandy is not a stranger to this organization. She's been on the program uh, at every convention, I think, since I've been president, uh, with the exception of a couple when she uh, decided she was going to run for a higher office and fail by a few votes making it. And she was out of circulation after a few years, but she came back. She is now our commissioner of insurance. And the strange thing here, Miss Gander, or is it strange? We haven't uh, heard too many things wrong with our insurance department since you've been holding that position, and we want to congratulate you on that here this morning. I'm sure you have some rather interesting remarks for us about your department, and while you're here, we'd like to know something about your future plans. I think a lot of people around this state are interested right now. What will you do next year. And with those remarks, it's my pleasure to present to you our Commissioner of Insurance, Miss Evelyn Gandy. Thank you so much. Mr. Ramsey, delegates to the Mississippi AFL-CIO Convention and guests, First, of course, I would acknowledge with deep and heartfelt appreciation the very kind and generous introduction just afforded me by my good friend and your distinguished president, Claude Ramsey. And I want you to know this morning that it was an honor for me to be escorted to this platform by this fine and distinguished group of your delegates seated here on this podium. And I appreciate the invitation and the courtesies that you have extended me here this morning as I have returned, Mr. Ramsey, once again to your convention. And you know, it's also a personal privilege for me to say once again, Thank you. My thanks to each one of you and to the other voters of the state of Mississippi for giving me the opportunity of serving as one of your elected state officials and presently as your commissioner of insurance. The support which you have given me, your help, and your encouragement and most of all, your friendship are deeply and sincerely appreciated. Now it's a privilege, which I always welcome, to give you a report concerning the office which belongs to you and which because of your balance, I now serve representing you. And I'm not here this morning to talk particularly about my political future because I'm engaged full time in discharging the duties of the office of commissioner. But I will say this, it's one of the most important offices within the gift of the people of Mississippi. I'm striving every day to discharge the duties of that office. I do believe that I can continue to be of real service to you in this particular office. And so I want to report to you on some of the things that we're doing, giving you a progress report this morning. Now you know, of course, that the laws of this state 
charged the Commissioner of Insurance with the responsibilities of protecting your interest, the interest of the insurance buying public, while at the same time discharging our responsibility under the insurance laws of this state regarding insurance companies and insurance agents fairly and equitable. It's our responsibility to license the, and regulate the activities of insurance companies and insurance agents in this state. Presently, there are over 1,100 of these companies, over 19,000 insurance agents qualified to do business throughout our state. Now, it's our responsibility to see that these companies and agents operate in compliance with the insurance laws of this state and the regulations of the insurance department. Now, in discharging these and other responsibilities, we daily strive to do the best possible job in advising, serving, and assisting the insurance buying public of our state. As well you know, the business of insurance affects every one of us in this room. In fact, insurance affects directly or indirectly every citizen of Mississippi. We can see the broad scope of insurance by thinking about life insurance, hospitalization insurance, automobile insurance, fire insurance, and burial insurance. And as you also know, this is a growing industry in our state. More and more of our people are becoming financially able to purchase insurance. And aren't we glad of this increased income in our state, making our citizens be in better position to purchase this type of protection for themselves and their families? How else can we tell that this is a growing industry in our state? By the taxes we collect from the insurance industry. This also is the responsibility of the Commissioner of Insurance. And this fiscal year, when we will have completed our records, we will turn into the State Treasury of the State of Mississippi over $20 million collected in taxes from the insurance companies and the insurance agents doing business in our state. This will represent an increase of something over 10% over the prior fiscal year. Just as our tax collections have increased, our total workload has increased. And we've encouraged this because as Mr. Ramsey said earlier, we have encouraged the people of Mississippi to let us be of assistance to every citizen in this state who may need information, advice, or assistance from your Department of Insurance. We've tightened our regulations and supervision over all companies and all agents. We now have a full-time examiner situated in the state offices, in addition to the examiners which we keep in the home offices of the companies making sure on a daily basis that the companies operating in this state are in compliance with the financial laws of Mississippi, having the proper capital, surplus, and reserves to protect the insurance buying public in this state. You see in your press from time to time and over the news media the names of companies where the license of that company has been revoked because the company is no longer in compliance with the laws of this state. We are regularly revoking license from companies and also from agents if those agents are found to be violating either the insurance laws of this state or the regulations of the insurance department. We have drastically revised our regulations governing the granting of temporary license to agents. In fact, we have revised them so drastically that it's almost impossible to get a temporary license now, and we feel by so doing this that we have practically eliminated the so-called fly-by-night insurance agent that had been operating in this state. <laughs> we
We have upgraded the standards for agents entering the insurance business for the first time in an effort to see that these men and women who are going to sell insurance to you are better qualified to advise and counsel with you concerning your insurance program. Now we have established and expanded a division of field services within the insurance department. In this division, we have now have field representatives and investigators who are available to work in all of the 82 counties of Mississippi. Some of them are out there today in our courthouses, in our places of business, and some of them in the homes of our citizens in an effort to make the services of our department available to all the people of Mississippi. Now, this was one of my goals when I ran for this office some years ago, and we feel that this has been major progress in having staff people available throughout our state. And we want here to ask your help because many of you have called on our department for assistance, but we want you to pass the word on to your locals, to your membership, to your family, your friends, and your neighbors. If they have an insurance problem or a question about insurance or if they have a claim that they need help on, please put them in touch with our office. You can call us collect if you want to, write us, and let us know. If we can't help them out of the state offices, we now have these staff people who are available to go out and help them. And you know it's not easy to write a letter about insurance. If any of you tried, you know it's not easy. And many people can't really give us the extent of their problem in a letter. But if you'll get word to us that they need our help, we'll send a staff member out there to talk with them and to make sure that the resources of the insurance department are made available to assist every citizen of this state in need of our help. Now, toward this objective of making our department more responsive to the needs of all our people, we have increased our efforts in communicating and disseminating information to the people of Mississippi. Here, I wish to thank the news media. They've helped us throughout the state in carrying our news releases concerning information from our department. We've tightened our regulations considerably governing the advertising of health and accident insurance. And I have regularly warned the people about the dangers and perils of mail order insurance. In fact, so much of this mail order advertising comes to your homes from unlicensed companies operating outside the state of Mississippi and mailing their literature to your homes. This is so prevalent in our state until many, many times I've said to audiences like you that as you look over this mail order literature coming to your homes, you probably will be better off to put about 99% of it in the wastebasket. Be careful about advertising coming to your homes direct from these mail order companies. If you do have difficulty, however, with one of the policies that you've purchased in the past, please let us know and give us the opportunity to do our very best to be of assistance to you. I mentioned a moment ago the unlicensed companies operating in our state. If you're not sure about the company you're dealing with, please call our offices and we'll tell you whether or not the company holds a current and proper license to do business in the state of Mississippi. And this is very important because if you purchase the insurance from an unlicensed company, our hands are at least partly and almost completely tied when you need our help, because these companies will be domiciled off in another state out from under the jurisdiction of your Department of Insurance. And so you, we hope you will help us pass on the word for our citizens to be very careful to see that their insurance is purchased from properly licensed companies. Now we've expanded our claim services in assisting our people with claims. 
And when we compiled our records at the end of 1973, we found that we had helped the people of Mississippi collect over $500,000 in small claims from various insurance companies that we think they would not have collected without our help. So please refer to us, any of your neighbors or friends, having this type small claim where you think we can be of assistance. Now certainly I would have to tell you at this point that if the facts are in dispute or there's some legal question involved, we may have to refer the people to a local attorney of their choice. But give us the opportunity of helping, and we certainly will do all that we can. Now, in conclusion, I'll mention only some of our safety programs because we were talking outside as we were waiting to come into the room about the importance of safety to every citizen of our state. Now, we've worked particularly in the area of fire safety. And this year, for the first time, a part of our insurance premium taxes will go back to the counties to help our rural people with fire protection. Now, you probably already have had this information in your legislative reporting service. But you know, I'm real proud of the fact, Mr. Ramsey, that now the insurance premium taxes are going not only for the people who live in the cities, but also for the people who live in the counties. Now this year we will send over $6 million, or in fact, we've already sent it, back to the cities and counties of Mississippi, taxes paid by insurance companies, sent back to our local officials to help with fire protection. And now I want to enlist all of you in having a greater interest in fire protection. Contact your local city officials. Contact your board of supervisors and see what you can help, what you can do to help provide better fire protection for all the people of Mississippi. While well, we just saw yesterday where two children burned to death in Hines County. People are being burned to death from fire. Property is being lost from fire. And we could do a better job if we all combine our efforts to bring about better fire protections, protection programs for our people. Now, I think there are three good reasons to work on this. First, to save lives. Second, to reduce property damage from fire. And third, and here's your tie-in with the insurance department, to bring about a reduction in fire insurance rates. We think it's a good program, and we were very pleased last year when the legislature appropriated over $2 million for a fire academy to be built out on state-owned property near the law enforcement academy. Now, we all know and believe, and certainly the facts show it to be true, that the law enforcement academy has helped upgrade law enforcement in Mississippi. So we believe a fire academy to train our firefighters all over the state, paid and volunteer, will help upgrade the fire service. And so we were very pleased that the legislature made this appropriation last year. Now, I won't try to get into many of our other programs, but I will mention two related to automobile insurance. We have recently approved a discount for people who take a defensive driving course in order to be better drivers. Now, all the companies have not filed plans to participate in this program yet, but a number have. And we are urging all companies to participate in this program. It means that if you will take the defensive driving course, and some of you probably have already had it, and get your certificate showing that you have successfully completed this course, you may be entitled to a discount on your automobile insurance. And while mentioning discounts, let me ask you to help on another matter. The young people in our high schools are entitled to a discount if they take driver's education in the high school. And do you know that the records show that only about 50% of our boys and girls are taking this course? Won't you help encourage the young people to take driver's education? It'll give them a reduction on their automobile insurance and hopefully 
it will make them better drivers, possibly save their life. We've also recently approved the so-called good student discount. Here again, we hope you'll encourage our young people to take advantage of it. This can amount to, with some companies, up to as much as 20 or 25 percent discount on the automobile insurance for our young people, and I know the rates are terribly high. Encourage them to look into this good student discount and talk to your local agent about it. Almost every company now operating in the state is giving this discount. And you parents might can use it two ways. You know, you might can encourage them to study a little harder and make better grades and get lower automobile insurance and use it as an incentive for our young people. We hope you will encourage them in this area. There are many other things that we're working on in your insurance department. I hope that many of you will find occasion to come to see us. We're now located in the Walter Sellers building on the 18th floor, and we will be delighted to have you come anytime. As Mr. Ramsey said earlier, it's been my privilege to be in public life for a number of years. And since the days when I was first in the legislature, I've appreciated the opportunity that the voters have given me to work for the people of Mississippi and to do what I could in the office of offices of responsibility that you have given me to work to promote the growth and progress of our state. And we've seen so much evidence of that progress, especially in recent years. Quite dramatic evidence in the increase in our per capita income, now approaching some $3,500 per year. Not enough, of course, but progress. And as we look at this progress, though, we say certainly there's much more to be done. Much more to be done by all of us, by your organization, by those of us in elected office, by all the people of Mississippi. There's still problems in providing more and better jobs for our people, better paying jobs for our people. There are still problems in the fields of education, vocational and technical training, housing, health, and welfare. And certainly there are no instant solutions to any of these problems, and you and I know that quite well. But if we work together, those of you who are private citizens with those of us in public office, if we join hands with our fellow citizens in every one of the 82 counties in Mississippi, working together to make Mississippi a better place in which to live, then I feel that we can not only accomplish that objective, but we can make Mississippi truly a leader among the 50 states in the quality of life enjoyed by our people. Thank you so very much. of this convention <clears throat> for doing such an excellent job with the insurance department uh, and your office in such a short period of time. I was sincere about this. Uh, prior to you being elected to this office, we had many problems, constantly in the news. And apparently you've uh, been able to clean the place up and do an excellent job in a very short period of time. We want to congratulate you on that job. But you haven't answered my question yet. You didn't really say anything about what your plans are for the future. Uh, is it too early, or, or haven't you made up your mind yet? We, we are a little bit interested in you here this morning. We've, uh, we've had several people before this convention uh, made political speeches, and uh, one man in particular uh, made an excellent speech, uh, didn't say anything about what he's planning on doing, and. And when I made a, <clears throat> put the question to him, he said he's going to leave it up to the people. And it brought the House down with a round of applause. So I don't know what this meant, you know. Maybe you might like to comment about this a little bit. 
I'm going to answer my good friend here this morning and say that my plans are to run for re-election, subject, of course, to the will of the people. See, that wasn't exactly what I thought we might get out of you here this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miss Candy. Uh, we know you, of course, have a tight schedule. Uh, we would like to extend an invitation to you to spend some time with us if you can. If you can't, we'll understand why. We do have some other speakers uh, scheduled to come in in a few minutes. If you'd like to see them up. Join us in the back. Okay, thank you very much. Another good looking Thanks. committee here this morning. <laughs> Well, I've been advised that uh, we will stay with the program and off the light on the podium. Yes, sir. We, uh, I can't see very good. I don't need to see anyhow. Is it in the way or something? No, I just put the light in the way. Turn the light off, you say? You want it off? Well, he's the man asked it to be turned off. Uh, are you the one that wanted it off or you? You want it off. Uh, let's see, where is the switch on it? Hmm? There we are. Now you're going to blind all our speakers that can't see their notes. They, they don't tell what they're liable to say. I've been advised that uh, Mr. Candine, uh, because of a previous engagement, <clears throat> would like to make his address on schedule. So uh, with this uh, information in hand, I'll now ask our escort committee to bring in our next speaker, Mr. Dean. Did you bring him on in, Mr. Dean? Oh, he's coming in from this door, my God. Well, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> the next speaker needs no introduction to Anyone president, I don't think. We've had him with us off and on during the convention. And uh, I've uh, had a lot of fun about it all, I guess. It wasn't too funny. It cost a lot of money, Flavors. I uh, told Theodore Smith last night that Ken Dean had rolled him off of the, off of the uh, podium up here, or the stage at least, on the, uh, the, the table for, <clears throat> for a guest, and I was kidding. I may mention the fact that uh, that he had broke the state organization, and I was kidding. I set him down by President Abel and suggested to President Abel that he keep his hands on both pockets or Ken would be in there, and I was again kidding. I want you to know I was kidding about all that, Ken. Uh, I acknowledge that here this morning. <clears throat> We're very proud of our... <laughs> He liked it. That's the wrong one. It's in the old. There's, there's nothing in it anyhow. But we are happy this morning to have with us a man we're very proud of. He's received the endorsement of the labor movement uh, in this state uh, as a Democratic nominee for the Congress in the 4th Congressional District. Uh, he's had a lot of trials and tribulations. Uh, he didn't know uh, where he was for several weeks. Uh, we, he didn't know who his opponent was going to be after the first primary. Finally got an opponent, finally won the Democratic nomination. I haven't been able to read a newspaper this morning. I'm not too sure where we are this morning. I'm not too sure if we're going to have an election on November the 5th or not. But I am sure of one thing. We've got a candidate with us today that's ready to run for that office when and if that election is set. And with those remarks, it's my pleasure to present to you Mr. Kenneth Dean, the Democratic nominee for Congress from the 4th Congressional District in Mississippi. Mr. Dean. Thank you, Claude. 
I've had a lot of fun in this congressional race, and uh, it's quite true that uh, we've been running for seven months and we still don't know who's in the race. Now, I had some people in the coffee shop this morning, and they said, did you hear Theodore Smith's speech yesterday? I said, no, I didn't hear it, but I heard about it. <clears throat> One guy said, well, it sounds like, <clears throat> like he's running for Congress. The other guy said, well, said he may be. There's 10 days left of the election. Said anybody can get in or out anytime they want. <laughs> so I don't know where Theodore is, but if he wants in, tell him, come on. <laughs> I uh, take seriously my bid for Congress, but I also have found out in life that one must also have a little humor along the way, <clears throat> lest uh, things get really boring. One of the things that uh, has been humorous has been my relationship to Tom Knight. Now, Tom knew when I got in this race that my wife was expecting my third daughter. So when we go places to speak, Mary would say, Ken, can I go with you? I'd say, sure. And Tom would say, no, she can't go, Ken. I said, why not, Tom? He said, well, you know, said, I don't want to get her labor movement confused with mine. <laughs> so, I told him, I said, Tom, don't worry about that. I said, we, this is our third baby, and we understand what's happening in our labor movement. Now, all you got to do is control yours. But sure enough, one night I was down in Natchez, and I got the telephone call, and the doctor said, your wife just came into the university hospital, and I think you need to get back up here. So I asked Tom, could he crank out one of his old sermons and try to tell the people down there the truth about what we was doing, that I had to go back and... See, my wife, who was having my third daughter, came a month early. So I got up here. The baby had already come. My wife was there, and she looked up at me, and she said, Did you get to speak in Natchez? I said, No, I left Tom Knight. She said, Well, look, call Tom and tell him that my labor movement has delivered now, I want to know what he's going to deliver on November 5th. <laughs> My wife is outside the door with the baby. She had planned to come in here and show you the baby, but we got a real problem with that baby. And I want to tell you what it is. You know, it's strange in this world the kinds of things that can affect young children. That baby is only six weeks old now, but every t when she brought the baby in the door a while ago, you heard it crying, had to go out. Well, that baby, every time I mention Tom Knight's name, she has to go change his diaper. <laughs> Talk, she doesn't need any help. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> I've had a, been called a lot of names since I got in this race, and uh, these names don't bother me, but my wife was making a list of them the other day. She said that I'd been called a non-superstar of TV, an unreformed reformer, an erstwhile double-dealing minister of the gospel, a captive of labor, a radical women's liber, and a wild spender. She said she knew that last one wasn't so because we never had anything to spend. <laughs> but I found out that my opponent is doing some strange things. I don't mind the name he calls me. And there's a little bit of evidence, I guess, to be put behind all of these tags, but my opponent's been creating a new work record for me. He has had me serving as a chaplain at some institutions that I've never served at. But not only is he doing that, he is also redefining the American language. I used to be director of the staff at Ridgecrest Baptist Assembly Grounds. That's up in North Carolina where they have about 500 kids to come in the summer from college and then they have Bible conferences all summer long and these kids serve on the staff. I used to be director of that. And the main pastime for these kids was cookouts. 
And every morning we'd have a mountain climb and a cookout. And what that was, we would get three couples or six people and we would give them a certain allocation of uh, bacon or grits or pancakes or something and they would hike up the mountain and they would build a little fire and they'd watch the sun come out or the sunset depending on morning or night and they'd have a cookout. And I, that was very nice. But a couple of Sundays ago at 11.30 in the morning, <clears throat> my opponent had some 800 people out on the reservoir in Rankin County. They pulled in a truckload of booze and called it a hair of the dog that bit you party. <laughs> and about five days later, here's the invitation, about five days later, somebody asked him, said, what were you doing out there? He said, oh, just two or three couples and my wife and I were having a cookout. I hope to goodness that the people up at Ridgecrest at that Baptist assembly have not changed their traditions so that the cookout means the same thing there that it does here. But I'd like to say something to my opponent, and I'd like for you people of the press to carry this message to him. I've been criticized for having talked about this uh, Cochran's cookout, but here's the point. We got a problem of credibility in government in this country from the local level to the top. We got a problem of creating trust among our young people and our public officials. And I say that if we, if we have a state law that says Rankin County is dry and you're not supposed to take truckloads of liquor over there, then I think that our public officials ought to honor that. But the question is whether or not he respects the laws of Mississippi. Somebody said to me, what about you, Ken, and your background? I said, you drink? I said, well, I don't happen to like it myself. But I said, uh, you know, I'm from a family uh, came out of the hills of Tennessee and Kentucky in the coal mining tradition. And I said, nobody in my family ever drank, but my grandpa and all of my uncles, they did keep a little jug under the bed for medicinal purposes. Uh, I guess, too, even if you got far enough back into my background, you could find a few revenuers there because in the 1930s, they weren't much to do in those hills. But anyway, that ain't the question. The question is the issue of respect for state law and the issue of creating an image of respect for public officials for our youth. And my point that I want you to carry to my opponent is this. All I'm trying to do is deal with the truth. And I'd like for him to deal with the truth. He could be like Wilbur Mills and put this thing behind him by coming out and saying, you know, this is what I did. I made a mistake. We're a very forgiving people and it would be finished. But yet he wants to cover up, cover up, cover up. And you know what that does. Once you cover one thing up, you have to cover that up with something bigger. And finally, your whole process gets involved in cover up. And that's what's happening with him. He can't talk to the press now. Refuse to be interviewed. Don't want to go into public debate. Cover up, cover up, cover up. But here's my point. If my opponent can produce anything that will show that I've ever served as a chaplain of an institution, there ain't nothing wrong with that. But I just, matter of fact, it's not true and I haven't, and he keeps harping about it. What he's really doing is interjecting the race issue. If he can show that, I'll get out of the race. If he can show that he didn't break the law in Rankin County that morning, I'll get out of the race. So, you know, I'd like for him to come forward and deal with the truth. So much for that. I'd like to move on to say just a couple of things that I think might be important to labor and important to the people in Mississippi. One thing is this, my opponent, when he ran for office, he wanted to create a new style in politics in Mississippi. And a lot of people like you and me put their confidence and their trust in him. But he has deceived us and here is the way he has deceived us. He went to the school teachers and asked for their support and he got it. 
But if you look at the National Education Association's evaluation of his record, 90% of the time he voted against the school teachers and against education. Those are not my figures in my evaluation, but they're the work of the school teachers. He has created a Senior Citizens Advisory Council. But if you get the evaluation of the Senior Citizens Council of his voting record, they give him an absolute zero. Not one time on the issues of importance to people on fixed income, people who have retired and live on Social Security, did he vote in the interest of those people. He has gone across this district and he has set up labor councils in various, labor committees in various cities. And he has left the impression that he's concerned and interested in labor. But if you look at the evaluation that labor has made of his record, not my evaluation, but your evaluation, you find that 93% of the time he voted against the working man in Mississippi. I say to create a committee and then to vote against the interest of labor is an act of deception. <laughs> I could go on. The same thing's true of the consumers group that evaluated him. They gave him a zero rating. They have said that he has supported the large business every time instead of supporting the consumer. I think these are the important issues in this race. There is a clear choice. It's not just a matter of Democrat or Republican, but it's a matter of who's willing to stand up and represent the interest of the people in this district where the median income is something just over $7,500. One other item that I would like to mention and I'll close out. You've heard a lot of speeches this week. And I know you're going to have to hear a few more, so I don't want to prolong my remarks. But I feel very strongly about this item. I was in Washington a couple of weeks ago, and I sat down and talked with some economists who worked for the government. One of the economists that I talked to uh, writes speeches for Mr. Simon and Mr. Sawhill. I asked this economist, I said, you know, what really is going on as regards the energy crisis? He said to me, well, for Mississippi, the situation is going to get worse instead of better. I said, why is that? I said, well, it gets colder up east, and they've got more people up there, and they can outvote you in the south. So more natural gas, more fuel oil, more gasoline, is going to go there come January and February. I said, well, what can you tell me to help me understand what's in the background of this energy crisis? And he said this. He said, we just learned last week that the Russians have put together a group of computer scientists and that they have taken this team of computer specialists and they have analyzed the American economy. And they have found that because we have a free market, that they can take their computer printouts and they can move in on our markets at a given time and create chaos and confusion in the economy of this country. They said, now this has been happening in the grain market. And I said, how does that relate to oil? He said, well, the point is this. So do you realize that the energy in the United States of America, the policy and what's available is being dictated by a foreign power in terms of the Arab world? Do you realize that the food industry is being affected and dictated to and controlled by a foreign power, mainly the Russians? Do you realize that the textile industry has been cornered and the policy on textiles in the United States of America is being dictated to by foreign power, the Japanese. He said, this is what's happening in the energy crisis. This is what's happening to the American economy. My point in conclusion is this. We are now involved not in a war of guns and airplanes and ammunition, 
But the United States of America is today involved in a war of economic espionage. And I, for one, don't think that the people who do not have at heart the best interest of America should be determining our economic policy. They should not be determining our food policy. They should not be blackmailing us in the area of energy. They should not be controlling what happens to our cotton farmers, to our soybean farmers. We have in this country today, we have allowed them through this foreign influence to pit the American farmer against the American consumer. We have allowed them to pit the large corporation against the labor movement. I think the time has come when we're in America. If the White House can't do it, then the Congress ought to take the leadership and do it, that we begin to develop an informed, enlightened policy of what's happening to our country. This is one of the reasons that I, for one, have no fear about having a veto-proof Congress. I have not, quite frankly, been impressed by Henry Kissinger's work. I do not think detente is the order of the day when detente means that we have a double in the cost of products, but only a 5% raise in wages. I don't think detente is what America needs when it means that the Middle East situation results in the blackmail on the energy front. No, I'm not very impressed by our record in foreign relations. I guess behind all of this, the thing that I feel strongest is this. Our patriotism is wearing thin in terms of where our major corporation stands. My opponent spoke last week to the Petroleum Association here, down at the Petroleum uh, Club, and on this issue, he said, why, we believe, do we not, in free enterprise. I believe in free enterprise. In fact, I think that more dollars need to go into the private sector than need to be continued into some of the federal agencies who have taken over the banking functions in this country. Did you know right now, if you have money to invest, that you can get a better deal by going investing it in a federal program than you can by going the private route. That's an imbalance in a capitalistic country wherein the socialism has creeped in to an extent that it outweighs the private sector. You get inflation. But my point is this. I don't think that we should sit by and any longer focus our attention on the issue of who broke in on Watergate, while the large corporations have broken away from their commitment to patriotism, to the American working force, to the values of America, and are now competing on an international market at the expense of the working man, at the expense of our tradition, and at the expense of our values. November 5th, you can elect a man to Congress who will do something about this. That's who I am, where I am, regardless of the names that I've been called. I thank you very much. Won't be a stand with me. I found out that Miss Dean was here this morning, and I wanted to at least uh, let you meet the lady and see the fruits of Mr. Dean's labor. <laughs> wasn't his labor at all. <laughs> She's really a pretty good baby. The only time she seems to cry is when her daddy makes a speech, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good luck. He's in a hurry. He's got to leave. Appreciate it. <laughs> Go look now and see uh, how many chairs we're going to need. Room 385 has an urgent call. Please call office in Washington. Is Mike Lucas present? Mike Lucas, is he here? Here he is, right here. To turn my light off and then to get that one on and I can't see sure enough. <coughs> Hubert Mills, is he present? Is Hubert here? 
Did Hubert get his call? Somebody uh, <clears throat> handed me a note here earlier that uh, Hubert Mills should call Shepard, the air code 216-253-3128. Is Hubert here? Did he get the call? All right. For you before we bring in the next speaker, I'm sure all of you are interested in this. The I've been advised that the Elections Committee has completed counting ballots and that they will be ready to report uh, shortly. And we will make a special effort to get that report right after President Abel makes his speech here this morning. Before we uh, bring Mr. Abel in, I'd like to acknowledge uh, two recent visits. Just walked in, Mr. Gene Didier with the American Federation of Teachers and Brother Howard Hersey with the American Federation of Teachers. Gentlemen, stand up and take a bow. I've uh, had, had a chance to introduce a lot of visitors to this convention. We've been so busy. I guess you found how to get introduced. Just walk in and hand me a card and tell us we're here. We're happy to have both of you. Is our next speaker ready? All right, well, I understand our next speaker is here and he's ready and we'll ask the committee to bring him in. Is Steve Williams in the house? Come on up here, Steve. I thought you was up here already. Come on up here. I think we're about ready to go. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, <clears throat> we're privileged to have with us uh, this morning a very prominent person in the American labor movement. But before I introduce him to you, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce a few people on the podium. Uh, that is outside of our local people. I'm not going to take time to introduce all of the delegates to the convention, but I would like to recognize Howard Strevel, District Director for the Steelworkers Union, Alabama, Mississippi. <laughs> Nick Zonerick, the Organizing Director for the Industrial Union Department. Stand up, Nick. <laughs> I'd like to turn this guy loose and let him make about an hour speech here this morning. You'd enjoy that. Uh, uh, let's, let's see. Uh, well, let's get Bill. Bill Rutledge, District Director for the Aluminum Workers Union, who, is, uh, who has several organizing situations going on in Mississippi, and I suspect before the convention's over with you, hear about some of them. And then, of course, our good friend Steve Williams on the end down there, who is the Director of the Coordinated Program in Tupelo, Mississippi. Steve, stand up and take a bow. I wanted to introduce these people to you because <clears throat> we have a very special occasion here in our state, special situation. Many of you, I think, are aware of the fact that <clears throat> the Industrial Union Department recently established an office in Tupelo, Mississippi, and currently have an organizing program sponsored by the Industrial Union Department, coordinated program in effect now. Some of the staff people working in that program are here at this convention, but most of them are back in Tupelo attempting to help some people organize some unions in the area. Now, <clears throat> we have with us this morning the president of the Steelworkers Union, President Abel, I.W. Abel, who is also president of the Industrial Union Department of the AFL-CIO. He is also a vice president of the National AFL-CIO, and he carries many, many titles. He's very reactive. His union is perhaps one of the fastest growing unions in the state of Mississippi. We have a number of delegates from local unions uh, in Mississippi, steelworkers unions, here at this convention. We have a number of staff people uh, of that union here in this convention 
Several of them are sitting on the stage up here now. One of them is a member of our executive board. E.M. Grantham sitting here as a steel worker, member of our state executive board. We're very happy today to have President Abel with us. He got in last night. Many of you met him. Uh, we had him on the podium up here with us as one of our special guests. We were very happy he could get in last night where I could spend a few minutes with him. And at this time, it's my pleasure to present to you Mr. I.W. Abel, President of the Industrial Union Department. Mr. Abel. Thank you very much, President Ramsey, for your kind introduction. Secretary Treasurer Knight, members of your executive board, my good friends on the podium who were kind enough to escort me in, to all of you good delegates and friends who are attending this most important convention in the great state of Mississippi. Let me assure you at the outset that this is indeed a, a privilege as well as a pleasure to come down and have this opportunity to meet with you and talk to you a bit about what it is we in the labor movement are attempting to do and the kind of a job we have remaining. I was impressed, Claude, when I came here last night, look out over the audience then and again this morning to look out over this audience and see the participation of, of this outstanding convention. I'm told, I believe, it's your seventh convention. And we of the North have been told many times, you know, about the lack of organization in the South and particularly in this great state of Mississippi of yours. But I have to believe after being here last night and now again this morning that the <coughs> assembly here is proof of a real spirit of trade unionism in the state of Mississippi. It proves to me that trade unionism does exist in this state. And I want to take this occasion at the outset to commend your officers and to commend each of you for the obvious good job that you've done thus far against tremendous odds, against uh, great opposition, and those people who devote all their time and expend great sums of money to keep organization away from the workers, so that they may dominate them and keep them under their thumb. Now, while it's evident that a good job has been done, from my conversations with your good president, with Nick Zonerich, with Steve Williams, and our own members of the United Steelworkers of America, and of course cognizant of the fact that there still remains much to be done. I'm reminded, you know, of the story during World War II about the great Prime Minister of Great Britain, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who during the stress and strain of that great conflict, the bombs dropping on the city of London, people scurrying for the bomb shelters, it finally started getting to him and in addition to burning up more and more cigars, 
story goes that he got nipping more and more on the brandy. And finally, the people of London got a bit disturbed about it, for all their lives were in peril, and they were in need of great leadership to hold them together. And finally, a group of ladies from the Women's Temperance League decided the time had come for them to call upon the Prime Minister and reason with him. They went to number 10 Downing Street, were admitted to the Prime Minister's office, and after the courtesies of introduction, he asked them the purpose of their meeting, and the Madam Chair later said, well, Mr. Prime Minister, we're here because we're concerned for our great country and our people. We're concerned uh, with the way you as our leader have been resorting more and more to the use of alcohol as a crutch. She says, as a matter of fact, you know, Mr. Prime Minister, from the stories we have received, it's safe to say that if you could put all the brandy in this room that you've consumed in the last six months, it would perhaps reach up to here. And the Prime Minister looked at her hand, and he looked at the floor, looked at her hand, and he looked at the ceiling, and he said, my, my, so much accomplished, but still so much remaining to be done. <laughs> And I, I guess it's uh, true with those of us in labor, you know. We have accomplished a great deal, but as we look about, there is still much to be done. It's a never-ending job, and it's particularly true in areas such as your privilege to represent here. And I am happy this morning to come here as both president of the IUD as well as president of the United Steelworkers of America, representing as uh, they too do, the United Steelworkers being the largest affiliate of the AFL-CIO and the IUD being the largest single department of the AFL-CIO. And I come primarily because you're good president. Claude Ramsey asked the IUD a while back if we couldn't find our way clear to come down and assist not only the officers of the state the federation, but the respective international unions who have jurisdiction in this great state of Mississippi in setting up an IUD coordinated organizing campaign to be of assistance. <coughs> and on the basis of President Ramsey's request, as you know, our good friend Nick Zonerich, after he discussed it with our executive board of the IUD, did come down and he and Steve Williams have set up an organizing uh, operation in the state of Mississippi, and we're here to assist in every way possible in doing this job of organizing the unorganized. I'm happy to report that Nick tells me some 15 international unions have already indicated a willingness to join in the effort and assign staff representatives to assist you in bringing about complete organization of the workers in this great state. Well, perhaps some people might ask, you see, and I, I know they do, why it is that the IUD, why it is that unions such as the steelworkers, the machinists, the IBW, so on down the line, is interested in directing their efforts and their staff and their money toward organizing the unorganized. <laughs> well, quite frankly, the job and the responsibility for carrying on this work has traditionally fallen to those unions 
who were better able to assume that responsibility. The labor movement, fortunately, has always had a philosophy of helping their brothers in need. And it goes not just with respect to those in a given industry or in a given trade or jurisdiction, but all people who work for a living. We all believe that we should all have the benefits of organization, the right to organize in the first instance as a primary right of workers in this country. And then through organization to join our talents and our abilities and our strength in improving the lot and the lives of the workers of this country. To do through our joint efforts the kind of a job necessary to improve life on a community level, a state level, and a national level. And so as we come to the state of Mississippi, on the invitation of the president of this great federation, I want you to know that we're carrying out an age-old tradition of helping those less able to help themselves. And I would remind you this morning that we of the steelworkers came into being because of this recognition on the part of others and because of their generosity. I was privileged just two weeks ago to go over to the state, or the state of Florida and uh, the city of Miami and speak to the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Convention there. And I reminded the delegates there, and I took again the occasion to express the appreciation of the United Steelworkers of America for the outstanding contributions the Amalgamated Clothing Workers made in the organizing of the steelworkers. And I reminded them that it was back in 1919, following World War I, that the AFL decided the time had come to organize the workers in this great mass industry known as the basic steel industry. And the drive was gotten underway, culminating in the first national strike in basic steel, a strike that was lost because of the ruthless attacks by the basic steel industry leadership of that day. But in that effort, the Amalgamated Clothing Workers made a contribution of $100,000 toward the organization and the winning of that strike. Now, to you and I today, perhaps $100,000 doesn't seem like an awful lot of money. But I would remind you that in today's dollars, that contribution from a young, struggling union itself <laughs> would amount to quite in, in excess of one million dollars. And so we of the steel workers have been ever grateful <coughs> to the amalgamated clothing workers. And as I said to them the other day, that it was that contribution and that effort on the part of the leadership of their union then and other unions, that while the effort failed, they were successful in sowing the seeds of trade unionism that did sprout and did flourish in 1935, when John Lewis and again Sidney Hillman of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers and others once again launched the campaigns to bring the benefit of trade unionism to the mass production workers of this country. And in 1935, under their leadership, came the response of the work that was done in 1919. And we did succeed in building the United Steel Workers of America. It now numbers proudly one million 400,000 workers across this country of ours. And so when we come here today, 
or as we came several months ago, to launch the organizing campaigns in your state. We were once again, you see, following in the footsteps and the tradition of the labor movement of the United States. And it was that kind of a motivation that brought into being the CIO in the 30s. And I would remind you this morning again that the IUD coordinated effort that's now underway is not a new thing either in that sense. Perhaps the organization structure is a bit different. Perhaps the participation is a bit different. But under the CIO, I remind you that Philip Murray launched what we call then as the Southern Organizing Drive under the leadership of that great organizer, Van A. Bittner, who came from the United Mine Workers and later became a vice president of our union, the United Steelworkers of America. And upon the passing of Van Bittner, we had an individual by the name of John Reif, who took over the work of the Southern Organizing Campaign. And through their efforts, you see, many people were organized. Our union, perhaps the, the outstanding beneficiary of the early efforts of the Southern Organizing Drives. And then some 15 years ago, the launching of the IUD coordinated effort under the direction of Nick Zonerich. And again, in various areas, we have been successful in assisting the affiliate unions in doing this job of organizing the unorganized. In doing the job that some people may say we should leave to others, I often think, you know, of an old, old poem that I I derived a great deal of inspiration from in my early days in this movement. Somehow I, I lost track of it as we seem to do in this sort of thing. But it had to deal with, with organization, with looking out for the interests of others. This poem, as I recall it, was titled The Builder. And it talked about the old frontiersman who on his creek west had forded one of the great rivers to the west. And after getting to the other side, he, he stopped to build a bridge. And as he was building it, another traveler came by and questioned the old man. He said, why are you now, since you've passed to the other side, stopping now at even tide to build a bridge when you're already on safe on the other side? And I recall well the, the main points that struck me then. Bowman went on to say that the old man raised his shaggy head and said, There followeth after me today whose feet must pass this way. He says, This dream which has been is not to me, to that fair-haired youth may a pitfall be. Good friend, he said, I'm building this bridge for him. Well, I often think, you see, that that's what we're doing in the trade union movement, in organizing the unorganized, in trying to give guidance and assistance to those who have been deprived, and perhaps in that way avoid for them many of the pitfalls that we encountered, such as the bloody little steel strike of 1937, 
and of other such instances that had befallen those of the labor movement. And I think we're able in this way, you see, to give the guidance and the direction and give the assistance, both from a standpoint of leadership and experience, as well as financial assistance that's needed to bring about stability in the labor movement. And so we in, in the IUD feel that this is our role in life, that this is an obligation, and we're happy indeed to make these contributions. In addition to this, the IUD, following the <laughs> successful efforts of coordinated effort, uh, organizing, set into motion some 10 years ago what we call a coordinated bargaining effort whereby we can give assistance to securing an agreement and the benefits that flow from organization and agreement to the workers through a coordinated effort with other unions in the art of bargaining at the bargaining table. We've been very successful. I think we have some 60-odd coordinated bargaining committees now established, and quite a staff of experienced people to, number one, bring the groups together to establish their mutual interests, to establish a program of policy demands, and then to give guidance to the organizing effort so that we're not pitting one group against another group, that we're not striking one set of workers while another set of workers continue to work and undermine their efforts. And through our coordinated bargaining effort then, bring uniform standards to all, whether they be working in a southern state or in a northern state or in a western state. Bring about uniformity, you see, of benefits. And I would remind you that one of the first things our union did in the 30s was to stamp out the so-called southern differential of wages and benefits applied by the steel industry to the detriment of our members working in the south. And as a result today, a worker in the mills in Birmingham, Alabama, receives the same wage, the same benefits as a fellow worker doing the same job in Gary, Indiana, or Homestead, Pennsylvania, or Buffalo, New York. <laughs> this is exactly what we're attempting to do through our assistance in IUD. Another important contribution of the IUD, in my judgment, that should and I'm sure is of interest to our local unions in areas such as yours. That is our pooled pension program, <laughs> where we're able through IUD to bring again together the respective affiliates of IUD and develop a program where the smaller employers who are not able on their own to provi provide a pension program such as we have in the major basic industries, to pool their resources with other employers and other unions, and through a pool pension program, then bring the benefits of pension and retirement with security and decency to the membership of these smaller unions. And I'm sure that Many of you, as you go down the road, will be joining with the IUD pool pension program. In addition, we've recently launched in the respective areas across the country what we call mini arbitration programs, where we again pool our efforts and set up a group of arbiters who are able to give us speedy adjudication of matters that have to go to outsiders for determination and not only provide speedy adjudication but provide that service to our membership at a reasonable fee. 
And here again are smaller unions and affiliates who are unable to have the benefits of permanent arbitration can receive the benefits through participation in IUD's pooled mini arbitration program. And so I say to you again, that the IUD exists for the service of the industrial unions affiliated with it, and the membership of those respective unions. And we certainly welcome all of you to participate in these services that are available. Well, let me talk a, a bit this morning about the real purpose of the labor movement the real down-to-earth purpose. And it's, uh, it's quite simple if any of us stop to ask ourselves the question, but I'm sure too often we don't because we hear the argument, why should we belong to a union? We're doing all right. Why let these outsiders agitate and disrupt the relationship here? Well, quite frankly, unionism is as old as this society of ours. Our society was built on unionism. That's why we're known as the United States of America. And practically everything we have done has been in unison with some other section or segment of our society. And quite frankly, that's why we have the standard of life. That's why we have the security. That's why we have the greatness, in my judgment, that we do as a nation, because we are a united people. In spite of our divergencies, in spite of our backgrounds, we are a united people. We're united because we understand that through unity we can do things together that we can't do for ourselves. And this, of course, is true with labor. Our purpose of the labor movement is through united effort to do the things that we can't do for ourselves, to improve the lot and the lives of workers and their families, to make our communities better communities in which to live and raise our families as well as to work, to make our nation a greater nation, provide a greater influence for the peoples throughout the world. And I say to you that the record of the United States of America is second to none. And I say to you that the record of the trade union movement in the United States of America is second to none. Now how do we go about improving the lot and the lives of people? in a society such as ours. The founders of the labor movement recognized, I think, quite well, and uh, to our great benefit, that this would be achieved in two ways. One, naturally, in dealings with our employers, meetings at the collective bargaining table, to improve our wages, to improve working conditions, and to secure more of the fruits of our total effort. In addition, it was recognized that in a society such as ours, we're to improve life, make it more secure, make our communities better communities, make our nation a better nation, then we must of necessity have full participation as citizens in government. And so it was determined we must take an active interest in our political processes. We must understand the issues, understand the philosophy of candidates, and above everything else, understand that we need support. <clears throat> Those who have a grasp of the problems of the people those who have a dedicated interest in serving the people. And then, of course, to 
get our membership so organized as to register their vote on election day for our friends and, of course, to oppose our enemies. And once we go through the elective process and, of course, exercise that responsibility that belongs to all of us of lobbying, lobbying for the interests of the people, and lobbying against special interests. And through then the enactment of legislation to improve our whole society. And so we've been working down through the years. On the one hand, bargaining with our employers. On the other hand, meeting our responsibilities as citizens in the political arena and at the legislative halls. And in the legislative halls, we are able to secure safety legislation to make the workplace more safe for the workers through the enactment of safety and health legislation, such as we accomplished just a few years ago. We're able to bring about the kind of security for our older people who finally are able to take advantage of the pensions we've negotiated at the bargaining table retire in a sense of security and in a measure of decency. We found that we should have more than just that pension. We should have a government that would guarantee that pension, reinsured if you please, just as we've been doing for some time for the savings of the more affluent who can have bank accounts and savings stored in the banks. We struggled for nine long years. But this past year and this past Labor Day, we saw our efforts come into fruition with the passage and the signing by President Ford of the Pension Reinsurance Program that now says to every worker, who through his union can negotiate a pension program, that even if there be skullduggery on the part of industrial leaders, even if there be embezzlement, even if there be takeover by conglomerate, or even if there be tremendous losses as a result of the stock market crash, you can retire now in complete security that if these things happen, the federal government will make good your pension, as it does the bank accounts. Now we're working on a national health program, as you know. And I'm sure again that through the united efforts of the labor movement, and our friends who have an understanding of the needs of the people, we will secure passage of a federal health program that's going to save us against the tremendous cost of sickness and injury and poor health. I'm sure for the benefit of those of you who are concerned about the eroding of your jobs by foreign imports, but through the efforts of organized labor again, we'll see the passage of trade legislation that's going to see to it that our jobs are not taken away nor our benefits taken away because of cheap foreign imports coming into this country. I'm sure too, you see, because of the efforts of organized labor, we will not see the enactment of a surtax program such as President Ford has proposed, but I'm sure that we will, through our efforts, see a complete overhaul of the tax structure so that once again we'll have equity 
in meeting the costs of government and the working people be relieved of the burden of that tax responsibility that you read about so many of the big shots avoiding through tax loopholes. These then, you see, are the kind of things you do through political action and legislative action. All of them designed and do improve the standard of life, not only of workers, you see, not only of workers, not only of members of trade unions, but of all of the people of this country. And here again, you see, we refute the argument of our enemies that labor operates in a narrow, selfish sphere. Labor certainly does not and never has and I trust never will. Well, let us talk a little bit now of collective bargaining. There is much, you know, to be done in the collective bargaining arena, and much has been accomplished. I am reminded uh, the days when we started our first agreement with the basic steel industry established the $5 day and the 8-hour day and the 40-hour week. And that was just about the extent of it. It recognized our union as the bargaining agent for its members. It allowed us to register a grievance, but there were no terminal points such as arbitration. There were none of the fringe benefits that we take for granted today. We're operating now under a new agreement we negotiated last April 1. We have now, and will have by year's end, established a wage standard with a minimum $5 an hour, not $5 a day. $5 an hour. And coupled with that wage standard is a cost of living provision. Cost of living provision. And I think you'll be interested in this. The new uh, <coughs> cost of living index was issued yesterday. It's gone up again as we all anticipated. And under our agreement with basic steel, and of course the same applies at different dates with other basic industries, Come the first of next month, our 500,000 members in basic steel will receive another wage increase of 16 cents an hour due to the cost of living clause. And for your information, this 16 cents that is due November 1 brings to the basic steel worker a total wage increase so far this year of 74 cents an hour, 74 cents an hour. There was the 30 cent wage increase, April 1, which was three months ahead of the time it was due. There was one cost of living increase of 13 cents an hour, another one of 15, and come November 1, a 16 cent one. So you see, we have done a tremendous job in the field of wages. In addition to that, we have established broad vacation programs that we never enjoyed prior to our union. In the case of steel, we not only go up to five weeks of vacation based on your service, but we have what we call the extended vacation program in our basic industries that provides 13 weeks vacation every five years, every five years. We have our paid holidays, and I recall well that we not only did not have paid holidays, we were not permitted to have the holidays off, with the exception of Christmas, but today we have them. We have in our basic industries 
what we call SUB, our Supplemental Unemployment Benefits. And to those of you who periodically get laid off, I'm sure you appreciate the fact that even though you don't work, the paycheck keeps coming in because of SUV. In our case, it's on a period of 52 weeks, one full year. And in addition to the SUB, we have established in our agreements an earnings protection program, we call it, that when there are layoffs and people are demoted, they carry the rate of the job above them for this period of time and thus relieving the hardship of reduced income because of reduced job responsibilities. Security against sickness and injury, not only of the worker but his family, is provided in the broad comprehensive insurance programs we now enjoy, including in our most recent agreements, the dental pl plans and programs. And pensions, I've mentioned them earlier. But I recall well, you see, the day that the United Steelworkers of America made the great fight. To number one, first have the right to bargain on whether or not an employer had a responsibility to its workers and the pension area. And I can hear Phil Murray yet saying that the workers are entitled to this kind of security when they get too old to work but are still too young to die. We carried that fight through the courts to the Supreme Court of the United States. We finally struck over the issue. We were successful in establishing at the outset a pension that provided $100 a month, including Social Security. Well, I think you'll be interested to know that in our major basic contracts today, we have a pension program, not just for those who become too old to work, but still too young to die, but we have a minimum pension for those who have 30 years service regardless of age. And today we have many of our members who have taken retirement at 50, 52, 55 years of age. And what is that pension benefit? The minimum pension today for 30 years service is $352.50. $352.50. And I remember well, and so do most of those who are taking that retirement, the many years they worked when they earned less for their labor than they now receive as a pension benefit. And for those who serve more years and are content to work longer, such as age 60, 62, 65, or even 70, the pension benefit now runs up to 85% of their earnings. And I say to you that this is an outstanding achievement in the record of the labor movement. It has done tremendous amounts of good for the people who can now face their later years with the knowledge that they have a major security and decency. And this had a tremendous impact on our overall society because those people no longer have to look to their family for protection in their later years, nor do they have to look to the grim realities of the pogey or the poorhouse. They're independent. They have dignity. And finally, with respect to our efforts at collective bargaining, and I oft times think it's the most important one. We have established and brought to the workers of this country industrial democracy. 
integrity, if you please, the right of the worker to question the boss, the right of the worker to file a grievance, and if need be, carry that grievance to an outside determination. And the only people you see who've had, I, I guess it can be termed the privilege, the privilege of working in a non-union shop, can we fully appreciate the values of industrial democracy and the dignity of man. So you see, these are our great changes that we've wrought in this industrial society of ours. Well, yes, people say that unions call strikes, they impose hardship on workers. Well, it's true we have had strikes, and I suppose we'll continue to have some. Sometimes there's no other way, you see, unless you want to yield completely to the wishes and the domination of the employer. But I say to you that strikes are not caused by the mere fact of organization. The strikes are not caused because workers band together and want to improve their lot in life. Strikes are caused because of the refusal of employers to yield the right to workers of self-determination, of joint effort, of improvement in their lot by sharing the fruits of their labor. It need not be, you see. And I happen to be one that believes that the day is not long for industrial strife and struggle as we've known it in the past in this country. <coughs> yes, our union is engaged in many strikes. We came into being through a tremendous strike. The little steel strike of 19... 37, when many of our members were shot down in cold blood in the Chicago Massacre on Memorial Day of 1937, and hundreds of others were shot and wounded or beat and thrown in jail. It was a gruesome thing that went on for 18 long months, but out of it, you see, came a union. The employers had to yield. And the workers won their right to self-organization together to try to improve their standards. And I've just recited for you what they've accomplished in these years. We struggled again in 1959 in basic steel. More than a half million of us out for 116 days. And what was the reason of that? <coughs> because the employers determined to take away the benefits that we had already secured. But I'm happy to say to you there hasn't been a strike in basic steel since that day. And hopefully there won't be another one in the years to come. Because both the industry and our union is found that there is a better way. And I couldn't help but be impressed with your entertainer last night, who in his talk on human relations talked about finding a better way. Well, we in our relationship with the basic steel industry, I think have found a better way. And why have we found the better way? Because at long last we realized that the mutual interests of both can best be served by working together. Because we found through our conflict and struggle that we had lost jobs, we had lost operations, that foreign producers were taking our markets, in 1971, 100 and 
or 18,300,000 tons of steel was imported into this country. And that 18 million tons of steel represented 108,000 steel worker jobs that we had lost. And we said there has to be a better way. And we found that better way in what we call the experimental negotiating agreement. Wherein we set up, you see, certain safeguards of our members and our union agreement. Provide safeguards for certain benefits. And we recognize certain rights of the companies, the employers. Then we say that we'll bargain on all issues. All issues. And if we fail to reach agreement, then we'll submit our differences to a panel of outside arbiters that we've already agreed to. Well, a lot of people say, you gave up your right to strike. Yes, we did. But I remind those critics that the employers gave up their right to take a strike. And I don't think we can underestimate the value that employers put on the right to take a strike rather than to give in to the demands of their workers represented by their unions. The employers also gave up the right to lock out. And they gave the right to outsiders, you see, to establish the wage standards that they must pay their workers as well as the benefits. Well, most industries refuse to do that yet today. And most unions look with a degree of skepticism. I happen to be one that believes that this is the trend in which we're going. Because, you see, we don't make progress by destruction. We don't make progress by tearing each other apart. We make progress by producing more, by working together to do what it is we can do to improve the whole. And as I have often said, we, we all recognize quickly <laughs> that we can't go to a dry well and draw a bucket of water. And neither can we go to the bargaining table with a lot of demands and justifiable demands to an industry or an employer who's fast going out of business and expect to receive them. So I will say to you that in my judgment, we'll continue down this road. And our experience in this go-around, as I mentioned earlier, provided agreement three months in advance of the expiration date and the wage increases went into effect then. We made substantial wage increases. We made these improvements in pensions benefits. We doubled our shift premiums. We added another week of regular vacation and we added another holiday. And we came up with a total package in the steel settlement of 1974 of $3.40 an hour. And I say to you, it is not every day that our union or any other union will go to the bargaining table and bring back to the membership that kind of an improvement in their wages and standards of life. So I say to you, my friends, that we of the steel workers will continue our efforts in this direction. And I'm sure as we go down the road, more and more are going to see the values of this kind of an approach. But it takes the joint effort to see of everybody. And while we may be able to do it in steel, there's still a lot of places we have. One of the reasons we haven't, because we still haven't completely organized as we should. You're going to do it here. You're going to continue your efforts to organize. And I say to you again in closing, 
that the Industrial Union Department, and I can say to you for the Steelworkers Union, that we want to be of help in any way possible, because we want to see every single worker in this state as well as every other state have the benefits and the fruits of organization. And we will certainly be working to that end. Those of you who will be interested in organizing your competitors in the smaller industries, we want you to take full advantage of the IUD organizing program, the IUD collective bargaining program, the IUD pool pension program, and the IUD mini arbitration program. It's a great job to be done. It's a tremendous amount of work. It won't be done by Nick and Steve and Harold. It won't be done by your President Claude Ramsey and his associates in the State Fed. It'll require the support you see of all of us. And those of you who are organized, who are privileged to be here today, have a responsibility. You're a fellow worker who works in the neighboring plant, or the one across town who still doesn't have a union such as yours. You ought to your membership that you're privileged to represent, to work constantly to improve those standards, the standards of wages, the standards of vacations and pensions and insurance. And only through the united effort of the labor movement can this be accomplished. You know, I... I sometimes wonder why it is that we allow ourselves to revert to that old selfish self-preservation position once we get a major security and allow ourselves to become self-satisfied. You know, we've had a local union down here, 77-72, that just went through a great struggle for six months. They did a tremendous job. They deserve the commendations of all of us for the manner in which they stuck together and the way that they came to it with flying colors. But they might have, you see, been spared a bit of that had we had greater organization, had we been able to receive greater assistance than the assistance that was given by some of you who were organized. We had a strike at the Dow Chemical Company in Midland, Michigan during the same time, and it too went for six months. 5,300 members of our union on strike that six months. And they were on strike that long because the employer was able to operate with supervision. And the supervision was able to operate the plant because the seafarers were delivering materials to barge and boat. And the teamsters were hauling finished products to passing the picket lines. And the building trade saved the plumbers in were going through special gates to carry on 13 new construction programs. So the Dow Chemical Company was able to smugly laugh at the United Steelworkers of America. And their manager and their personnel director said to me, you have little influence in the labor movement. Only the plumbers respect your strike. Well, I thought we shall see to that. When we had our executive council meeting in August this year, I went to the building trades and I said, I want to meet with your council. And we had breakfast. And I told them the problem and the story. And I said, you know, this is not just our responsibility. This is just not the struggle of the workers at Midland, Michigan. If we're to bring the fruits of organization to the workers in the chemical industry, and preserve them for all workers and the building trades, have a responsibility to assist in this struggle. And so the building trades leadership agreed that these 13 new construction projects within
them the properties of the Dow Chemical Company would come to a head. And I went to Paul Hall, the president of the Seafarers Division of the FLCIO. And I sat down with Paul and told him the story. And I said, Paul, I think your seafarers have a responsibility to assist the steel workers in seeing to it that the union of these workers and their benefits is not destroyed by this ruthless corporation. And Paul Hall shut down the ships. And I went to President Fitzsimmons of the Teamsters Union. And I said, Fitz, here's what's been going on. And even though you're not a part of the FLCIO, you are a part of the trade union movement. And I think we're entitled to have the support of the Teamsters Union in this struggle. And you know, out of those three meetings, came a joint bargaining committee representing every one of those unions with a member. We jointly and unitedly went to the Dow Chemical Corporation. So now are you ready to talk business? And you know, in 10 days, those 5,300 members of the United Steel Workers were back to work with an agreement second to none. And it came about. It came about, you see, because of the joint efforts of the labor movement, and the recognition of the responsibility of one to the other. And I say to you here today in this great convention of yours, go from here. Go from here in the knowledge that you not only have a job to be done, but that you have the support of many who are interested in seeing it done with you. And I would make one more comment, and that is with respect to the political end of it. You, like we all over, have a job to do come the 5th of November. It's an important job. And it can't be done on the 6th. It must be done on the 5th. And I would close with this story, I think. It might be helpful in you doing the job that is yours to do on the 5th, electing this outstanding young man that was here last night running for Congress helping us in every other way, and then going out and doing the job of organizing the unorganized. And I have told the story quite often, and I think it conveys better than perhaps other ways the need to get on with it. It's a story about a bumblebee and a bull, a prize bull, this farmer had this rancher. It was a surprise when he had it in the special pasture. Special pasture of heavy clover and big clover blossoms. And in that same pasture took up residence this bumblebee. Who delighted periodically of buzzing around and stinging the bull. Confusing him and confounding him at all times. And one fall morning about this time of the year, the bull was grazing along and as he crested the little knoll, he saw sitting on a juicy clover blossom his friend the bumblebee. Quite inactive because of the coolness of the morning and the light frost, and he thought, well now is my chance to take care of that fellow once and for all. He slipped up quietly, and as he got within range, he dropped the clover bush, the blossom, bumblebee, and all. Swallowed him. And after the bumblebee had rolled down the bull's throat, landed in his stomach, he warmed up, revived himself, and started looking around. And uh, almost immediately, he 
recognized what had happened. The bull had slipped up on him and gobbled him while he was in that state of inactivity. But he thought, well, Mr. Bull thinks he has me, but actually I have him. I'm in here now where he can't even chase me, and I'll just sting the living daylight out of him. But before I do, I'm going to finish my nap and really be stirred up for a job. So he lay down and went back to sleep. After some time, he woke up stretched himself, started feeling good, and he thought, well, now, comes my time. I am going to have my fun. But as he stood up and looked around, you know, he found the bull was gone. <laughs> so the moral of the story, of course, simply this. You have a job to do, get on with it. Don't take time to sit down and take a nap. Because sure as you do, you'll find yourself in the same position as the bee, with the bull gone. So do your job between now and November 5 in the political arena, and get on with your job of assisting and organizing the unorganized. And I'm sure, Mr. President, that one of these fine days you'll be good enough to invite me to come back to your great state of Mississippi, at which time we'll find this hall is much too small for the delegation, and we will find the great state of Mississippi. Not only an outstanding industrial state, but one that is well organized. It's been a real pleasure to have this privilege to come down and meet with you and talk to you a bit about the work that we have in the labor movement. Let me again express my appreciation for the invitation, for the hospitality, and express the best wishes for success in all of your efforts. Thank you an awful lot. Thank you much, Brother Abel, for bringing off such a splendid address. I'd simply comment by saying this, that we just need more I.W. Abels in this trade union movement. Would you agree? And I have to say that we need more people sitting down, more labor leaders sitting down, discussing prob common problems towards that common objective of winning a labor struggle as he exemplified in the dark chemical situation. I can think of two or three things going on in our state right now. That if we can get our labor movement together, we'll find the answer to that problem. Thank you very much. Now, before he leaves, We've got a couple of vestors I want to recognize. I went down and got a couple of distinguished guests. I am going to now recognize the rest of this committee, Brother Orman, Boilermaker, dele Delegate, Brother uh, Moss, the Steelworker Representative, our good wide director, Amy Hollowell, Amos Hood, the Steelworker Representative, Brother Underwood, a Rubber Worker Representative, member of our board, Joe Davis, an IBW representative, a member of our board. These people sitting on this program are involved, most of them, in the Industrial Union Department Coordinated Organizing Program in Northeast Mississippi. And I wanted you to know that. Now, we ain't too. We got a few more distinguished guests that's been in this convention for several days that I'd like to recognize why President Abel is here. And I can't see too well in the back of the room. But I know that Red Hill with the Rubber Workers Union has been here for several days. Is he here now? Director of Organizing for Rubber. Has he stepped out already? Hey, Well, I'm sorry. He probably gives me out. Didn't think I was going to get to that. I know that, well, you're present. Al McIver, he's a member of the Steelworkers Union and directs a coordinated program in the Carolinas. Right, Hal? We're happy to have you here. And I know that 
Brother Sabatina, Vice President of OCAW is here. I hope he's still here. What is, brother? There he is in the back. We happen to have you. Now, he is a member of the IUD committee that will be meeting with Brother Abel here this afternoon as soon as we adjourn. I understand he's going to have a meeting of his committee to talk about more organizing programs. I may advise that Brother Saul Stetton, the president of the Textile Workers Union, has arrived that he's present in the hall. Would he let us know where he is? Right in the back. Paul, what is this, sweetie? Paul Sweetie, vice president also of the Texas Workers Union, is here also. <laughs> Introduce the director of organizing for IBEW earlier this morning, Mike Lucas. He's still here. Stand up. Let the president of the Texas Union Department know you're here. And I know I've missed somebody. Now, where's the rest of the group? They've been here several days. All right. John D. Fee. Paper Workers Union. John D. Fee, stand up and take a bow. Involved in an IUD program in Tupelo. Now help me out a little bit. I can't see too well up here. Who else is present here yet? Hey, Upper Nancy with the Aluminum Workers is here also. We hope. Is he here? Where is he? Right there. All right, have we missed anybody? John Kissick, is he here yet? Have I missed anybody? I'm sure we've got other people present. They've been here. We haven't been able to get around to recognizing, and we just decided to take time to do that now. Cousin Abel, we're so happy you came down and visited well this morning. We wish you the best of luck. and. I can assure you of one thing, with help like yours, we're going to get things done in Mississippi. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> as soon as they get out, we've got a little business we have to take care of. We have to make a decision. Uh, we'll do that right away. As soon as uh, Brother Abel's got to get out, he's got a meeting of his group. I uh, have to make a decision now as to how long you want to work. Let's take a reading of the situation, then we'll let you make the decision. Uh, I can't stay here too much longer like some of you can't stay there. We'll have to break here pretty soon. One way or the other, for reasons I can't expose right now. Uh, we, we have completed. Uh, we don't have any speakers left now. We are now down to taking care of the convention business. The Constitution and Bylaws Committee has completed its report, but we still do have two other very important committees Yet the report. Three, that is. The Elections Committee, the uh, Resolutions Committee, and the Cope and Legislative Committee. We have a number of important resolutions to come before this convention. I believe if we were to recess right now, I believe if we could grab a quick bite to eat and get back here by 1 o'clock, All right, impossible. All right, what you want to do, 1.30? 1.30, recess and come back at 1.30? Now, we wait just a minute. Wait just a minute. We've made arrangements with the hotel for late checkout. There's Brother Knight. Just stepped out. I'm of this opinion, and perhaps we, we need to, you know, let you know a little something on the pike before you leave for lunch. Yeah, get him in here this opinion, <coughs> just taking a quick reading on where we are, and if we can get back here properly at 1.30, with good luck, unless we've got some people want to talk an awful lot on resolutions, we ought to be able to wind this thing up by 3 o'clock. That's my candid opinion here. Maybe sooner than that. That means that some of you might want to check out Get your bags ready and be prepared to leave around 3 when we when we break it up. Does that sound okay to you? All right, 1.30, back here.
It's the opinion of the chair that we do have a quorum present. We're going to call a meeting to order. This time I'm going to recognize the chairman of the Education, Cope, and Legislative Committee, Brother Bob Woodson. He has made a suggestion that I think you'll agree with, that instead of reading the resolutions in their entirety, that he read the resolve part, and we act on the, on the resolve part. You've had those resolutions in your kit since you've been here. You should have read them already. And this would expedite the business of this convention tremendously if you go along with this recommendation. Is that okay? Yes. All right. Chair recognizes Brother Woodson. <coughs> thank you, President Ramsey. I would first like to thank the members of the committee who worked with me and considering these resolutions, Brother C.E. Schaefer, Vice Chairman, Sister Una Matheson, Brother E.M. Grantham, Brother Ed Lowe, Sister Edith Hopper, Brother Frankie Gil Gilmore, Brother L.D. Clark, Brother Joe Franks, and of course to replace Brother Nikkei, who will not hear Mr. Ma Maurice Mullinax, Brother Claudius Dyer, and Brother M.M. Hedgeman. Let us look at resolution number one on the second page. And the last be it resolved, the letters AFL-CIO should be deleted. And the resolution should read, the be it resolved part of the resolution should read in this manner. Now, therefore, it be resolved that only the National Health Security Program introduced by Representative Martha Griffith and James Corman meets all the tests for viable National Health Insurance Plan. We endorse it and urge favorable consideration of health security. We also urge all candidates for House and Senate to publicly state their position on National Health Insurance so that the voters can elect supporters of National health security, and be it further resolved that copies of this resolution be sent to all members of the Mississippi Congressional Delegation. Your committee gave consideration to this resolution, and of course we wholeheartedly recommend its concurrence with the deletion of AFL-CIO in the last be it resolved, Mr. Chairman, and I move for its adoption. I think the committee is reporting a recommendation, the motion to adopt. Do we have any discussion? Not all in favor of the motion signified by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so on. Thank you. In case you don't know, I should have mentioned this at the outset, we are dealing here with resolutions 1, 2, 4, and 8. We will now go to... Resolution number two, this is the uh, political education and political action resolution. And there have been some language change in the be it finally resolved. And that language change I will read in when I get to the be it finally resolved. Now, therefore, be it resolved that this seventh biennial convention of the Mississippi AFL-CIO Assembly in Jackson, Mississippi, October 21, 23-1974, recognizing and express appreciation to all those who have participated in and supported our political education and political action program through the years, thereby making our success possible. And be it further resolved that the Mississippi Labor Movement, with the leadership of the state FLCIO and local central bodies, expand and intensify our efforts in the political arena and that each delegate present accept the responsibility of seeking the active participation of every union member and be it finally resolved that each local union establish a committee, leave the COPE out. If there is not one in existence and initiate a campaign to collect at least two dollars for each member, from each member, and add the language for COPE. And that copies of this resolution be sent to all affiliated organizations, add the word organization, in the AFL-CIO Committee on Political Education. Mr. Chairman, again, the committee 
think this is a very viable resolution and recommend this occurrence and I so move for its adoption. You've heard the committee's report and the motion to adopt with those changes recommended by the chairman. Do we have any discussion? Not all in favor of the motion signified to say an aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We will now deal with resolution number four. There has been some changes in resolutions number four. The be it finally resolved on page two of resolution number four, which deals with legislation, the legislative and education form, has been changed to a be it further resolved instead of be it finally resolved. And of course, we added a new be it finally resolved, which I will read to you when I get to it. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the seventh biennial convention of the Mississippi AFL-CIO does go on record reaffirming support of this fund and recognizing the need to increase same. And be it further resolved that every local union in Mississippi be requested and urged to contribute at least one dollar per member to this important fund immediately. Be it further resolved that copies of this resolution be mailed to every local advising them of this action and that the delegates assembly here assume the responsibility of seeking prompt compliance with this action. And this language was added to this, be it further resolved, and it reads like this, and that the officers of the Mississippi AFL-CIO avail themselves to present this program upon request by any local union. And that the officers of the Mississippi AFL-CIO avail themselves to present this program upon request by any local union. Did you get it? Okay, I'll go over it again. And that the officers of the Mississippi AFL-CIO avail themselves to present this program upon request by any local union. The additional be it finally resolved read like this. That the president of the Mississippi AFL-CIO be instructed to call a special convention in conjunction with the 1975 Cope Convention to consider an increase in per capita tax. Did you get that additional language? Okay. That the President All the Mississippi AFL-CIO be instructed to call a special convention in conjunction with the 1975 Coke Convention to consider
consider an increase in the capital tax. Mr. Chairman, your committee gave quite a bit of study and consideration to this particular resolution. And of course, we face the reality within the committee that sooner or later, if this organization is to continue and function and function on an effective basis, which it was established to do, that we're going to have to have adequate funds to run it. Now, somehow or another, I find that most union members seem to think that unions and labor organizations doesn't get caught in the jaws of inflation. But I think you know, as, as well as I do, that inflation has uh, not only hit us as individuals, but uh, is a, it has hit the uh, everybody and everything in some respect, maybe with the exception of the Wall Street game. So recognizing this reality and realizing this, we added this new language. If you will note that the president under Article 4, Section 2 of our Constitution has authority to call a special convention if it's deemed necessary, what this resolution does is, is instruct him to do so in the year of 1975 because of the fact we think by that time we'll know what our status will be in a lot of areas. And with that, Mr. Chairman, your committee recommends concurrence with this resolution and I move for its adoption. Okay, you'll make the report of the committee along with the changes made by that committee in the resolution, and as I interpret that, Bob, we'll be having a COPE convention next year anyhow, and what you're suggesting that we do is to also take up the matter that you have in this resolution at that time. In other words, we don't call it a special convention, but it'll be dealt with by the same convention that'll be called together for the purpose of endorsing candidates. Is this correct? This is really what you're talking about, isn't it? My, Mr. Chairman, I don't interpret it in that fashion. I interpret it uh, as, as what it says. And it says that you are instructed to call a special convention in conjunction with the Coke Convention right. to consider this measure. If, if, this is, if this is the action of the delegates to here. Well, this is what I get out of it. It's what I want to make sure I understand. We'll have a Coke Convention anyhow next year. And if this language is adopted, then the matter of the cap increase and so forth will be placed before that convention. What I'm getting at is it won't be necessary to call another convention. We'll have one already. Right. Right? Right. Okay. All right. Do we have any discussion? You've heard the motion to adopt. Brother Beckham? Uh, try the other one over there, Brother Beckham. I just wanted to a uh, point of information. You would have to uh, adjourn the uh, COPE convention and then open up the special convention. Is that right? I think perhaps that's what we'd have to do. The delegates, uh, the delegates uh, COPE convention, the call would have to go out. We'd have to phrase the call, I think. Uh, as, a special, as a special convention, because I don't, I think right. it would, it's not constitutional. Under the COPE um, constitution, to take up matters of um, the state organization. Well, the coach. Uh, I, uh, again, I think that the, the matter of, I'm not too sure of what we might have to not get out two separate calls, one on the court call and one on the constitutional change. And have the, co the same and delegates could serve in both conventions. And have the co a COPE convention and then adjourn it and open up the special. Absolutely. Something. I don't like that would be I think right. that's what you would have to do right. under, the, under the present uh, body. Have to do that, but, uh, that can be worked out if the resolution passes. Otherwise, you'll only have one convention. Mr. Chairman. Brother Schaefer. 
C.E. Schaefer, Delegate Local 605, and a member of this committee. What the committee really had in mind at the time uh, of the addition to the resolution was a matter of economics. Right. Let's bring enough people in for the Coke Convention that we can also uh, call, through the proper call, a constitutional convention for the purpose of considering the capital tax increase. Right. Same delegates serve both ways, right? Right, okay. Okay, do we have any further discussion? You ready for the question? Well, the night wants to speak. The chairman delegates, uh, just a couple of words about uh, one of the resolved in this resolution. The bill covered, of course, refers to the Legislative and Education Fund that was established several years back and has been continued from time to time. I just want to impress upon the delegates here and, of course, the representatives of the various unions the importance of this resolution and what it's about, and the importance of you going back to your delegation and giving them an explanation and to impress upon them the importance of responding to this. Now, this is not a must. After all, if it is adopted, it is the action of this organization, the delegates duly elected and assembled here. What I'm simply saying is that we have an, a situation existing that is next to deplorable when it comes to funds to continue to do the necessary things in this organization. And this is something, if this is adopted, the response to this will largely direct our activities for the next several months. So I don't think we can, can impress upon you too much the importance of going back to the local union and stressing the importance of responding to this resolution if it's adopted here. Because as you have heard repeatedly over and over again, the responsibilities of this organization are increasing just as the size of the organization is increasing, and certainly we are happy to see this. But we have to spend considerable time that should be spent somewhere else and doing other things, trying to figure out if we have the funds with which to do the things that confront us each day. Now that's what this is all about. And as Brother Woodson pointed out, inflation has hit the family budget, you just simply cannot buy the things that you used to buy for the same price. In many instances, they're double. Everything is inflated. And the cost of operating the labor movement at any and all levels is inflated to the same extent as it is any, in any other area of life. And I just wanted to simply stress the importance if this is adopted, of getting the necessary response at the local union level. Thank you. Thank you, Brother May. Very good. I said this morning I was kidding, but I wasn't. I just say that to the press. We are busted. And it would be helpful if you would do what you can when you get back. Are you ready for the question? All in favor of the motion to adopt resolution number four is amended. Signified to say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and sorted. Before I recognize the chairman again, I've got something I want to call to your attention. We were asked last night to take a straw poll on the governor's situation at this convention. And I asked my secretary this morning if she could find the time to prepare a sample ballot, similar to the one that we used yesterday on the presidential thing, and uh, <clears throat> they 
got that gun and somebody, one of Sergeant Arms brought one up here this morning and I guess I misunderstood him. I thought he said they had it ready for distribution. And apparently what he said was that they had already distributed the thing. And you should have one of them on the table. If you don't have one, we'd like for you to get one and mark it before you leave here. Anybody thought that hadn't got one, hold up your hand. Right, let's get them one, and we'll, we'll hold up long enough to do that. Those of you that don't have one. There's a hand over there. Hold up your hand. Anybody don't have one, keep it up, but get one to you. I was going to stuff the ballot box. <laughs> I can see the ballot box getting stuffed here already. Nobody got one. Ain't nobody got over two, have you? <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to try to do that now. I'll just make sure everybody's got one. If the sergeant arms will make sure that anybody that comes in gets one, then I'm going to simply ask you to mark the thing and. As you leave this afternoon, give it to the sergeant at arm. Would you do that, please? We'd like to know what you're thinking is yet. The chair now will recognize Brother Woodson again. Chair, committee of the, uh, chairman of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We will now deal with resolution number eight, which deals with uh, Mississippi AFL-CIO's legislative programs. And, of course, the legislative program uh, in and its entirety is attached to the resolution, and I'm sure that you've already read it. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the initiated referendum procedure be placed at the top of our legislative program, and that the attached objective to be adopted as the Mississippi AFL-CIO's legislative program, and be it further resolved that the legislative program be printed into an attractive brochure and that copies be mailed to each member of the legislator, the governor, and the lieutenant governor. Mr. Chairman, again, your committee studied the resolution in the legislative program, and we think that they're a very comprehensive program, and we recommend concurrence, and I move for their adoption. You ready for me to report the motion to adopt resolution number eight? Do we have any discussion? There's only one change been made in this to what we've been having, and that's the fact that because we have so many young people in the labor movement, a number of people that's not familiar with the right to work situation, and the fact that it is a part of the Constitution, we felt it would serve a definite purpose to adopt this resolution, rephrase it some, and call the attention to a lot of our own members what we have to do to repeal right to work. So right to work, the repeal of right to work through an initiative referendum procedure now would become at the top of our legislative agenda if this resolution is adopted. Do you have any discussion? If not, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Opposed? Motion carried and sorted. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the work of this committee, and I would like to ask that this committee, committee be discharged with the thanks of the convention. Thank you, Brother Watson. You heard the, the chairman's recommendations that his committee has completed its work, and that he'd like his committee discharged with the thanks of this convention. Do I have a do I hear a motion in that direction? All in favor of the motion signified by saying aye. Opposed? Motion carried and sorted. Thank you very much, Brother Watson. Doing such a good job and doing it fast. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Brother Fly, Chairman of the Resolutions Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We will also follow the same procedure. We'll just read, read the resolution. But the chairman of the Resolution Committee would like to say one thing before we get started. I know everybody's in a hurry to go home, but passing the resolution is just as useless or as not even coming to this convention if we don't put it into action when we get back home. And these are some foods for thought that we've had here, and I'll read my resolve, and this 
If anybody wants to discuss them, I'll ask them until after the, we'll ask the discussion. But I will now read the result. Now, for Number three. Number three. Number three. Biennial Convention of the Mississippi AFL-CIO does go on record, expressing appreciation to the AFL-CIO Executive Council and the International Union for the past efforts in this matter, and urge that all immediately intensify the full affiliation campaign. Be it further resolved that the delegates assembled here take it upon themselves to contact the officers of all unaffiliated locals and urge them to get the local unions affiliated with the state FLCIO and local central bodies. Be it finally resolved that copies of this resolution be sent to the FLCIO, President George Meany, Secretary Treasurer Lane Kirkland, and all international unions. Uh, the committee recommends concurrence in this uh, resolution. And I so move. You've heard the committee's report. In the motion to adopt resolution number three, which will probably be a very important one if you don't want to raise the capital in uh, 1975. Do we have any discussion? There's one way to keep from raising the capital, get everybody affiliated. All in favor of the motion to adopt resolution number three, signify to say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried in the floor. Uh, the next one will be resolution number five. Resolution number five. The resolve. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Mississippi AFL-CIO will cooperate with the National AFL-CIO acting through its Department of Education to bring the contribution of the work amendment Working, Amer working America to the forefront in the bicentennial activities, and that it be further resolved that the executive officers of the Mississippi FLCO are authorized to participate in the bicentennial activities in the state to the extent that they deem advisable after consulting with the Department of Education of the National AFL-CIO. And I'd like to express what some of the committee talked about when we were discussing this. This seems so unimportant. The some of the committee expressed their opinion that how long have you had the opportunity to sit down at the bargain table? Forty years. It took us over 150, 60 years to get to the place. When the Wagner Act was passed some close to 40 years ago, you had a right to sit down at the table. And we felt as a committee that we need to participate in the bicentennial, and, and to any extent, not only at the FLCO in Jackson, but at your local union, if you have a committee to celebrate this uh, great occasion that we're going to celebrate next year, the 200-year birth of the American people, and we got our freedom. And then we so concur. <clears throat> You've heard the committee's report and the motion to adopt resolution number five, which will probably be, if we make it that far, one of the most important occasions in our lifetime. Do you have any discussion on the motion to adopt? Not all in favor of the motion signified to say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so on. The next one will be resolution number six. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the seventh buying the condition of the Mississippi AFL-CIO does go on record in favor of the following items. Call upon the Congress of the United States to impose quotas on all products from foreign countries where heavy employment is occurring in the particular industries in the United States. Appeal to all Amer American manufacturers to cease sending their work or product to be made in foreign countries. Appeal to the general labor movement of the United States to buy only American-made products as well as the union-made products and services. Also, to try and educate the American consumer on the grave problem facing American workers and all consumers to buy American-made products as well as union-made products and services. Be it finally resolved that the copies of this resolution be sent to the necessary individuals and organizations to call attention to this serious problem. 
And I'd like to make a few comments what the committee instructed me to tell you. They wanted to know what could we do. It happened right here in Jackson, Mississippi. Somebody was building a great big building and using foreign imported steel, and I think it hit the fan. And another thing they wanted to tell these girls sitting here today, these young ladies and the buying people who spend about 85% of the money produced or uh, earned in this country, when your wife goes to the store, first look for union labor. Also to buy American-made products. We had one lady from the uh, garment workers, uh, made clothing workers, I call them garment workers, express uh, my opinion. They say, well, this don't hurt, but I got some friends in the shoe industry up in Naugatuck, Connecticut, works with a U.S. rubber company, ask them. They got about 4,000 people laid off. But we buy a pair of shoes from Italy, we get them from Spain, we get them from Yugoslavia, we get them from Japan, Taiwan, and everywhere in this country that we live in. So there is something you can do. When you go home, if there's a building going home, go to your board of supervisors and say, gentlemen, are you going to be using American-made products? Is it going to be a union-made product? And some of these contracts can be written that they won't use anything but American labor. And you can say it's going to be union labor if you've got enough power over your super supervisor in your county. There's something you can do at home. Or either with your mayor and board of all and you talk to them. Now, looking at this sign over here, it says you get involved, and I don't think anybody said anything about it. The only way we're going to solve this problem is all of us get involved. It's one right up here if you want to look, and there's one over there. But this is what's going to solve. Uh, and the committee recommends concurrence in this resolution, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Bobby. Flying. The motion is to adopt resolution number six. I've agreed to recognize Brother Marvin Taylor to speak on a resolution. Brother Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I note by hearing the report of the Credentials Committee that we had 279 delegates present. Before I speak on the last part of this resolution, I'm going to speak for it, but I want to emphasize one part of it. I would like to see the show of hands on how many building trades delegates we have in the hall. Will you hold you up your hand? Thank you very much. Uh, what I'm going to say, with just that few number of building trades uh, delegates, I'm afraid I'm going to have to borrow that shotgun in self-defense because I'm going to say something that you may not like too well. Although I think it's important to say it. I have reference now to this number three of the resolve appeal to the general labor movement of the United States to buy only American-made products, and I'm for that, as Brother Fly is. Now, look at the other part. As well as union-made products and services, emphasis on services. Now, we have been fairly well educated, and this is a continuing thing as far as looking for the union label is concerned. We'd have to give credit where credit is due, particularly with the ACWA on selling the idea of looking for the union label. And uh, of course, uh, in my organization, which is Carpenters, the building trades, our members are when they take the obligation, they hold up their hands and say that I will look for the union label and I will buy only union-made goods and employ only union labor when same can be had. Now, the most important product that you will ever buy, I think, is a house to live in. and it doesn't carry a union label. Now this services though, in the last part of this number three, 
would come into that category, and that's the part that I want to emphasize as a building tradesman. And I have jotted down here a few questions that I want to ask you. You don't have to audibly answer these questions, but just in your own mind, will you please um, let it soak in and think about it uh, in the future, if you will. Now, I was very much impressed with what uh, Mr. Abel said this morning about the help that was received from the building trades in the Dow Jones chemical dispute. Now, if this is not a a brotherhood and a sisterhood and a hands joining type of thing that we see as far as the AFL and CIO is concerned, then I have been misled all of these years. And I can tell you now that the building trades people is in a, a pretty much of a fix. You have a 5.8 un national unemployment, so we are told, with about 5% here in the state of Mississippi. We also, in the building trades, have over 13, it may be 15% unemployed, which approaches the state of depression as a depression is defined. What I'm saying to you, that if uh, people that belongs to the unions would, would, uh, would look at the services and employ the services of building trades people, a lot of our people would have jobs that don't have jobs today. Now, these are the questions, and that will be my discussion on this thing. Now, don't answer these out. Question. When you bought your home, did you make inquiry as to whether or not it was built by members of building trades unions? Number two. Just prior to, building, to the building of your new home, in shopping around for a contractor was inquiry made as to whether or not he employed members of the building trades unions. Number three, when it became necessary to repair your home or any of the electrical plumbing systems and appliances and so forth, do you care enough to ascertain whether or not these repairmen belong to one of the respective building trades unions. You want to uh, trot out that shotgun by bring it along. In building your new home or repairing the old one, have you ever looked in the telephone directory and called a building trades business agent and asked him to give you a list of fair contractors that you could choose from and patronize? When you're, now we're getting away from the home business, we're gonna get down there where you work. And this ain't gonna cost you nothing. When your plant contemplates an expansion requiring the services of a building contractor, do you being an employee and having knowledge of this expansion, pass this information on to the building trades business agents. When your plant has a major installation of new equipment, finding it necessary to contract out this work, are you concerned if a rat contractor brings scab labor into your plant and does the work? In your negotiations with plant management, have you ever attempted to include a clause that would require consideration in using fair contractors in the installation and maintenance of equipment? One more question. When your local union contemplates the building of a new hall, or repairing, remodeling, painting and so forth of your old hall, does it make any difference to you if this work is done by scab labor? I'd have to say in all fairness that Claude Ramsey has gone out of his way to assist 
uh, the building trades. He may have done more for the building trades than some of our building trades people. But now Claude Ramsey at the level in which he works is not able to do some of these things that I'm talking to you about. It's got to be out there where you are and where we are. And so I'm laying this on the line and I hope that you take it in the spirit in which it's been given, which is a spirit of cooperation and helpfulness, and that in the future, you will think about some of these things that I've been talking about. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Brother Taylor. Very well put. And I certainly concur in your remarks. And I will give it back to you in just a half a minute, Bob. <coughs> One of the, yes, we're going to take a vote. One of the, <clears throat> one of the purposes in having a convention of this kind, one of the things that we attempt to do <clears throat> is to have an educational type program for the benefit of those new delegates. Some of you old heads have been around for a number of years, might have got bored during uh, President Abel's speech, for instance, because he reviewed a lot of labor history this morning. But I think that perhaps a lot of the young delegates that are just coming into the labor movement might have gained an awful lot by that speech. And I think perhaps that many of the delegates present here this afternoon got an awful lot out of what Marvin Taylor just said because they were very well put and timely. We will now take a vote on the motion to adopt resolution number six if we don't have any more discussion. Do we have any further discussion on resolution number six? Ready for the motion? All in favor of adopting resolution number six, signified by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Resolution number seven. Therefore, it be resolved that the delegates assembled in this convention to solemnly pledge their untiring efforts to bring organization to the unorganized workers of Mississippi. We will work all of our segments of the labor movement to bring this about, that we urge our members to refrain from spending their hard-earned money with any other business who conspire to prevent workers from organized, and be it further resolved that copies of this resolution be mailed to the FLCO and each affiliate of the LFLCO, and that we seek their cooperation in every respect. And I'd like to tell you some of the thoughts of the committee that I was on. This committee says, and they feel this, and I don't want to hurt any international rep feeling or anybody's feelings here that's a full-time organizer, but this committee felt very, very strongly if the local people whether it be in Jackson, Mississippi, or whether it's down just south of here at Hazelhurst, or whether it's down on the Gulf Coast, or wherever it might be up in North Mississippi, Northeast, where we got our drive going on, that the local people, now you can send some people in here from Ohio, or New York, you can flood the state with it. They can sell a good job. I'm not taking anything away from those people, but the local people in the local area can say it, sir, a better job and do a better job of selling the labor movement in their area than anybody from Ohio to come down to organize a rubber worker in our office in Akron, Ohio. I, I got amused at Claude yesterday, and Claude and I have been friends for many years, and we've worked together when the uh, labor movement wasn't very popular in the state of Mississippi, and especially in, in southwest Mississippi. But we do not have one plant, or we maybe have one that just moved in. We've got some campaigns going on. But the sanitation workers, the firemen, everybody in our county, with the exception of a few, and they, we had an organization campaign, they laid them off with five, all but five people, and we're in trouble with that one. But we do feel very strongly, and this committee says we've got to get some of our girls involved. We opened up at a big plant down in Brookhaven. I'm sure it's going to be a lot of the minority group there. They got to get involved, and this committee said they should. It's going to be a lot of people involved, and Hazelhurst is going to have to help them. And the people in Brookhaven area is going to have to help. I mean, the people right around that area is going to have to help to organize these plants and get them into the labor movement education. And we concur with resolution number seven, Mr. Chairman. 
We so move, Mr. Chair. You've heard the committee's report and their motion to adopt resolution number seven. Do we have any discussion? Before we put it, uh, the question I would like to advise you that on page two, uh, one of the whereas is it makes mention of the conspiracy and the fact that I and the state FLCO have been sued for $100,000. Uh, might uh, ought to let you know that this came out of uh, some of our activities in connection with the policeman's union here in this town. Uh, one, of the <clears throat> one of the people involved, one of the thieves that had the fish in that situation brought the suit was advised by the attorney handling this situation for us recently that the fellow was trying to withdraw it, but some people are objecting, but we have good reason to believe that that suit will be dropped in the next few days. We have any further discussion on resolution number seven? Not all in favor of the motion to adopt, signify it to say an aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Chairman Fly. Resolution number nine. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Mississippi AFL CIO expresses unqualified support for the United Farm Workers Union and their struggle against the oppressive practice of the giant agro business concern, and be it finally resolved that the Mississippi AFL CIO write a letter to each local union and each central body. Council urging them to establish a boycott committees in the area of the state to support the United Farm Workers in the struggle for justice. And you know this is on grape and lettuce is what we referred to. And this goes back to the housewife again. You go back home, the young ladies is here, the sisters are here. Uh, go back and then refrain from buying these when you're in the supermarkets and these, the guys that's here go back and tell your wife, let's don't eat any more lettuce for a while. And the committee, right, uh, Recommends concerns, concurrence, and I so move, Mr. Chairman. You've heard the committee's re recommendations and a motion to adopt. You ready for the question? All in favor of the motion to adopt resolution number nine, signify it by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. I understand you have another one yet, Brother Fly. One more. Resolution number 10. No, you don't have that, do you? And this one, I don't know what happened to it. Ah. Uh, let me explain this one to you. This is a resolution that was presented to me by a gentleman at the University of Southern Mississippi requesting that we give the matter consideration dealing with the Olympic Games next year, 1976, I believe it is. <clears throat> And I brought it before our executive board, and it was adopted the day before the convention. Consequently, we haven't had an opportunity to run it off for distribution to the delegates. It's very short, and we'll ask Brother Fly to read this one in its entirety, since you don't have it before you. I'll read it I, after I get through reading. If anybody wants to read it real slow and copy it, it will, but I think it's self-explanatory. Whereas the 1960s, 1976 Olympic Games will be held in Canada, whereas our young athletes are endeavoring to compete against athletes of other countries in these games, and whereas our national government does not subsidize these athletes, and whereas the labor man of the nation has always shown a deep interest in all our people, especially of our youth. Now, therefore, it be resolved that we recommend that each AFL-CIO local union in the state of Mississippi contribute both morally and financially assistance to the sending of these athletes to participate in the Olympic Games to be held in Canada in 1976. Uh, I think that's self-explanatory. The committee uh, was recommends concurrence in this, and I so move, Mr. Chairman. You heard the committee's report, the motion to adopt resolution number 10, which was read to you in its entirety. And due to the fact that you don't have copies with you, we'll make sure that this one's mailed to you after we leave here. Because I think that one is also important. We're having a discussion on the motion to adopt. While he's going to the mic, let me make an announcement. Uh, Steve Williams and Hubert Mills, are they in the house? 
Steve Williams, and or Hubert Mills, call the hotel operator. Jones R. Fitzhugh, Cartman's Local 3031, Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. Hasn't these Olympics been changed to Russia? No, they're in Canada. This is 1976 we're talking about, Brother Fitz, year after next. <coughs> this, the ones we're talking about, will be in Canada. We have any further discussion? All in favor of adopting resolution number 10, signified by saying aye. All opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Brother Fly. I would like to uh, express my appreciation for this committee, and I didn't read them when I started off, and I would, and I'd like to ask the chair to dismiss this uh, committee when I get through with this list of names with a vote of thanks from this convention because they were a real great body of people that got together and we had a lot of discussion. Robert Fly, Chairman, Wayne Goodman, Herbert Williams, Lewis Carter, George Johnson, Alice Deason, Joe Bass, Uli Burdett, Bobby Caldwell, Linda J. Moody, Charlie Hall, Doris Milliton, and Allie Burton. And my thanks to this committee. Thank you, Brother Fly. You've heard Brother Fly's remarks and his motion to discharge his committee with the thanks of this convention. All in favor of that motion signified by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Let me confer with Mr. Knight for about a half a minute. Wood in the house. Come forward, friend. We think we're ready for your report. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the elections committee to give its report. Brother Wood. Mr. Chairman, fellow delegates. Chairman Wood would like to voice his appreciation for the following members of this committee. John Abrams, Darla, Poteet, Sarah Chestnut, Gall Smith, Loretta Hunter, and Margaret Towery. And also especially thank the very efficient secretaries that these gentlemen on the rostrum so ably, willingly provided us. Stand up and take a bow. Miss Carolyn Stand Phillips, Diane Morgan. Stand up, let's take a bow. Get him in a good humor. Go <laughs> get three days off. The <coughs> committee this year didn't have the problems it did have two years ago. I will announce the votes of each candidate. The votes received are out of a total of 25,022 votes. There were a few voided ballots due to mismarking, misvoting, but by no means, any way at all, close enough or were there enough involved to create a difference between one candidate or the other. R.L. Tucker, the first one I name, or for vice president. R.L. Tucker received 24,597. Robert Woodson received 24,228. James Johnson, Jackson. James Jackson, received 22,917. Russell Kelly, 23,612. Curtis Orman, 18,027. Robert Fly, 
12,104. Robert Fly was eliminated due simply for the lack of vote. You want to declare these? Yeah, the first, the first five. Then or please declare those five first five. Mm -hmm. Right. The first five so named are declared as the newly elected vice president, Mr. Chairman. Right. The following are votes received for the executive board. Marvin Taylor, 23,505. Joe Davis, 24,875. Laverne Tucker, 23,986. Howard Underwood, 24,411. Mary Bryant, 22,873. Dennis Smith, 11,501. Lewis Turner, 21,510. Herbert Williams, 13,881. E. N. Grantham, 17,111. Cecil Shelton, 22,343. Mavis Rochelle, 23,553. Doris Miller, 22,646. Doris Miller, 22,646. The following two candidates were eliminated for the lack of votes. Dennis Smith and Herbert Williams. The following names were elected by the votes received. Marvin Taylor, Joe Davis, Laverne Tucker, Howard Underwood, Mary Bryant, Lewis Turner, E.M. Grantham, Cecil Shelton, Mavis Rochelle, Davis, Doris Miller. They are your newly elected executive board, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well, you've uh, heard the report of the elections committee, and it would appear that <clears throat> all ten members of the executive board have won by a substantial majority, and that all five members of the executive committee, the vice presidents, named by him, have also been elected by a substantial majority. And unless someone wishes to challenge the vote, raise some serious question here, we're going to accept the recommendations of the election committee and declare these people being elected. Here none, then Mr. Chairman, we are happy to receive your report and take recognition of the fact that you and your committee put in many, many long hours on this job. And I would like now to get a motion to discharge this committee with the thanks of the convention. You've heard the motion. All in favor of the motion signified by saying aye. Opposed? Motion carried and sorted. Now, we still have some other business to take care of, so don't everybody leave all at one time. Chair now wants to recognize <clears throat> Brother C.E. Schaefer, a retiring member of the executive board. Brother Schaefer. Thank you, Brother Ramsey. <clears throat> Brother and sister delegates, my main purpose 
of appearing before you is to give a thanks for the privilege that you have afforded me over the past 14 years to be among this group of executive board and executive committee members. Now, let me say this. As a challenge to each one here, I'm in no wise or no way or no manner leaving the labor movement. I deliberated on this question with myself more than anyone else for the past two years. Some of the reasoning that I did was because I recognized new blood in the labor movement, and I think this is good. Sometimes we get so wrapped up with our own problems that we fail to recognize the need for changes. There is no one who cannot be replaced in the labor movement with the talent that we have uh, in the movement today. I guess the appropriate thing for me to do would be say that I have thoroughly enjoyed every minute that you've permitted me to serve. This could not be said in all honesty with myself and before God. The labor movement in the state of Mississippi has had some real, real crucial days. Probably when I was close to a freshman on the executive committee was some of the most crucial days. Looking out over the audience here today, I can see that this corner has been turned and progress has been made. And this is through the unification of the labor movement in the state of Mississippi. It hasn't been too many conventions back that I made the statement that one of the greatest things that could happen would be to appear two years, four years, anywhere down the road with an objective and say that the affiliation of this group had doubled. Well, <clears throat> if my memory serves me right, this has taken place in the last eight years. I don't think I'm too far off base on this statement. But let me just say this as a matter of challenge. The problems that we have today are only magnified over those 10 years ago. This is one of the reasons that I did not consent to my name being placed uh, in re-nomination or nomination for re-election. Our local unions, Local 605 and Local 985 of IBEW, have, in my opinion, comparable problems. I wouldn't say that they're exaggerated or greater than anyone sitting out there. We all have our problems. But to emphasize what I really want to say, let me uh, give you an illustration. I was absent from convention yesterday. There is no industry of the magnitude of the utility industry, especially the electric utility industry in the nation today that are struggling with economic problems any more than the electric utility industry is. Well, what does that do to us? Well, <clears throat> the first thing is this. This matter of uh, passing on auxiliary fuel cost to consumers now, I think I'd be relatively safe in making the statement that there's 50 percent or better of you people, including myself, that has been real irritated with the bills that we've been receiving from our electric utility uh, companies, be it co-op, be it investor-owned utility, or be it TVA. Now, <clears throat> the result of this has been taken a real bombardment of the utility companies over the bills. Now then, for the first time, and this is made of the coconut, for the first time since 1947, when we got rid of the last non-union contractor on Mississippi Fire and Light Company property, has there been a piece of work awarded to a non-union contractor? With the bombardment, public opinion appealed or petitioned to the Public Service Commission for a rate increase 
to overcome the inflationary deficits that's been caused. We had 75 miles of line to go up for bid. There was $452,000 difference and a $1,125,000 job between our fair contractor uh, and Mr. Stuart C. Irby. Not only a nationwide line contractor, but now an international contractor. Now, <clears throat> there is no way with our working conditions and wages that we can compete under today's contracts with this type of competition. I've been sleeping with this bad bedfellow since July the 1st of this year, and it's really caused some sleepless nights. Now, <clears throat> what is the solution to it? Well, let me continue on one further. The one thing that I hear with my pleas to the utility company to avoid the non-union contractor is this that our books are under full audit to the Public Service Commission of the state of Mississippi, which is a political uh, entity of the state government. Now, <laughs> with this, plus two legislative committees being involved in the question of fuel, uh, primarily, they take the position that we cannot have political groups auditing our books and finding out that we made a deliberate giveaway of $400,000 just to let a job to a fair contractor. Now, I'm not so sure that our local unions can stand publicity like this, which in our political arena in the state of Mississippi, they would welcome, in my opinion, uh, such a piece of publicity. I think they would stand a good possibility of destroying us as collective bargaining units. This cannot happen. So <clears throat> when we come to self-defense on matters of money, uh, we in turn apply pressure somewhere else. I'm not making a plea for, the, plea for the utility company, but really what I'm saying is this, to uh, give or lend some support to what uh, President Abel said here today, there has got to be better ways of doing things than what we like to do. Now, the labor movement is real dead set on status quo or upward trend. This is good. Economically, this is good. Competitively, it's not good. Frankly, I wish I had the solution to our problem. I need your help. I need everyone's help. The plan that I have right now, and this is going to create new problems and will be new ground almost on a national basis. If I can persuade my local union, 605, construction unit primarily, to, and I have an inv invitation to do so, and in fairness to every member that I represent, I think I have to, approach the Mississippi Power and Light Company whereby I will bargain an agreement for them for an itinerant construction force and eliminate a contractor. Now, this last phrase is what I really hate to do. We have an awful lot at stake. Our contractors have been uh, political allies to us uh, over the years, and I'm talking about the National Electrical Contractors Association. Uh, <clears throat> legislative issues, they are right in the camp with us on most issues. This, of course, uh, will create some problems here. So, <clears throat> really what I'm saying is that we've got new problems, and to me they are multiplied problems, and we need your help. We'll try to keep you informed as to what uh, our motives are, uh, what we attempt to do, and plead for your support in attempting to do it. Now, it brings us to one challenge. We have to recognize the times, and we have to cope with the times, and we have to find better ways of doing our jobs. Stuart Irby yesterday gave me the threat of a nationwide apprenticeship and training program whereby 
they will train their own people and they will be in more competition with us than they have been in the past. They have no intentions of diminishing their operations. The only way they see is up. Now, this was beside our program. We was attempting to get them to sign contracts whereby they could participate in our programs in what is referred to as uh, an apprenticeship state operating under Commission of Florida, which is a, department, uh, a commission of the Department of Labor. In order to utilize or benefit from any segment of government-funded projects in the state of Florida, they have to be registered in an apprenticeship and training program. Our outside electrical line program is the only one in Florida, and this is what the meeting was about yesterday. They do not want to participate under our terms. Now, the alternative is if they get a registered program in Florida, then it will spread nationwide, and this, of course, will increase the competition. Again, I'll say uh, I thank you for the privilege of service or offering me or permitting me uh, to serve you in the past, and if I can help in the labor movement in any way in the future, don't hesitate to call. Thank you, Brother Ramsey. Thank you. Leave, but I let you leave. Just <laughs> hang around for a minute, Jack. I I want to say, in behalf of the officers of this organization, that I deeply regret to see you have to make this decision. Jack Schaefer has been perhaps one of the best, if not the best, supporters of this organization since I've been president, Jack. Thank you. And I want you to know I'd see you go. Thank you. And hang around. I think I'm going to let you give the obligation to officers here. Sit down for a minute. Brother Beckham. Brother Chairman, <clears throat> fellow delegates, T.G. Beckham, business agent of the local union, IBEW Local Union 1435 Jackson. I, too, hate to see Jack move out of this organization, although I think we do have uh, a fellow that to fill his place. I don't say that he will do the job, but I say he will try. And I have had the pleasure, I considered it a pleasure, to have nominated Jack Schaefer for vice president representing the IBEW on the, as a vice president of this organization every time he ran except once, and I consider that an honor and a pleasure. And for the 14 years of unselfish, untiring time that he has spent as an officer of this organization, I would like to make a motion that this organization draw a proper plaque and present it and present it to Brother C.E. Jack Schaefer. Your motion, again. Now, I'm not going to recognize any more speakers until we get this in our way. We're going to get the horses up here, get them installed, and then we're going to start recognizing speakers. Okay, Brother Beckham. This, the motion, if you will accept it, and I can get a second on it, and we have a motion to his, uh, a second to his motion that a plaque be drafted and presented to Brother Schaefer. We did have a second. Are we having a discussion on that motion? All in favor of the motion signified by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Brother Knight, you, you and I have another job fixing up another plaque. I can see that. But uh, this is one I'll be happy to have work on. Uh, I now will... I'd like to ask the newly elected executive board and officers to please come forward, and I think we're just going to ask Brother Schaefer to give the obligation. We had in mind probably getting Steve Williams, but he's finally tied up. But I think it'd be appropriate for Jack to do it anyhow, don't you all? What do you think? Come on up. Come on up front, all of you. Been elected. Let me call your name out. R.L. Tucker, Robert Woodson, James Jackson, Russell Kelly, Curtis Orman. That's the five vice presidents. 
Marvin Taylor, Joe Davis, L.L. Tucker, Howard Underwood, May Bryant, Lewis Turner, E.M. Grantham, Cecil Shelton, Mavis Rochelle, and Doris Miller. Are they all here? Give us a couple of minutes. We've got to find the obligation here. I guess it's all right if I uh, turn my back to the people whom I'm obligating to some extent. Okay, uh, each of you raise your right hand and repeat after me the following obligation. I, C. E. Schaefer, I do, hereby do hereby promise to faithfully perform, to faithfully perform the, duties the, the duties of the office to which I have been elected to, which I have been elected, to the best of my ability and to the benefit and honor of the Mississippi FLCIO. And the event of my resignation, the of my resignation or removal from office, or at the expiration of my term, I promise to deliver to my successor all property in my possession belonging to this council. I further promise to protect and defend, protect and defend the, American Federation of Labor the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, Congress of Industrial Organizations during my term of office. Term of office. Congratulations. <laughs> You think they're ready to go? I, uh, I just, uh, I just made a statement up here that I'd like to afford the new, uh, each member of the board, this is usually the usual procedure to have an opportunity to have a couple of words to say before we adjourned the convention sine die, and they suggested you'd heard enough speeches that you're about to leave anyhow. So I still wonder if anybody's got anything on their mind they feel the urge to have something to say, I think they still ought to have that opportunity before we officially adjourned. Just let us wave goodbye at them as we leave. Well, is that what we want to do? All right, well, let me, let me say before you leave, that I think we've had one of the best conventions we've had since I've been president of the organization for the benefit of those of you still present. We've had some problems. Hopefully when we have another convention, we won't have the parking problems and things of that kind. When you come back next time, we'll do it up round. We will now declare this convention officially adjourned sine die. Good luck to all of you. How's that? Let's see what